So they were gathering there, and, but there was a lot of us, a lot of us young ones who were content and feeling in the audience, I don't think that's enough. No, we need to act upon these pule too. Not just pule, we have to actually move to our pule. Um, and really, there was a bunch of us, you know, of course, the days coming up, there was like, we blocked the road, we, we know, we're not gonna let them happen. And then when it was really coming to it, we were like, Okay, I don't know if I can do that. You can do that, Anna can do that. You can do that? I don't know. <laughs> so I was going up there, if anything, the most thing that we were getting ready to go into was um, we knew they were live streaming the event, so we figured let's get to the site and go hold signs so the whole world sees our signs. Yeah. Um, you know, there was a, uh, whenever we go up onto the Mauna, no, the original, one of the, the original couples that are going to speak of when you go up onto the Mauna is. So it's always Mali, it's calm, that is the sound of the Mauna. Um, and so we go to the Mauna, it's not a place for making big, loud noise or anything like that. Um, it actually really is not a place we're supposed to go anyway. You know, it's Vawakua. Um, and so with this, uh, conducting ourselves at our highest level is always very important. So this idea of the couple of Aloha and how we conduct ourselves has been around for a while. For, for myself, and many of the others who regularly we uh, do ceremony in the mountain, we always have to, we always conduct ourselves in this way. And so it was questionable for us too, like what are we going to do? How, how are we going to behave on the mountain? How are we going to stop anybody on the mountain? Um, so all of that organization you saw on the mountain was no organization whatsoever. There was just a lot of people who came, and a lot of people who felt the same calling in and out, and. 
Many of us, we started at the bottom, Puuhulu Hulu, Dirampule. We came up um, to Halepohaku area where the second altar is. Where normally we give, we give our pule there as well. And then we just started seeing the caravan coming up the road. And that was like the, oh my God, they're actually coming. Okay, for a lot of us, we've never been. This is like a first, the first rodeo for us. Now we've only heard the stories you know, of all the of the other movements of the past. So I've never seen the videos and stuff, you know. But this is the first time that myself, I can say, was been in something like this. And you know, Na'ao just started to fly. And some of us were on the road when those trucks were coming up. We just started for Oli. We started for chance. Some of the aunties over there just broke down. And it was really one of the, your typical pictures. Why you do this to us? Auntie slamming her fist on top of the vans. Everything was was eha. You no, know, was true eha. Our chants became whales. You know, we we and just the whole feeling of it. But then we felt our energy after that. We were so oh so eha. It was strange to me to have this feeling on Mount Awakea. Because every time I go up there, we're there in Pule, and so the feeling is, is a particular way. So to feel ourselves in this kind of energy in our sacred place, we know, oh, this is not Pono. This is Ali my Kai. Um, we then made our way up the Mauna, and we got up to the summit. We were blocked. There was actually a police truck and a ranger truck in the road. So as much as they like to say that act, um, you know, pro uh, protesters blocked the road, we never blocked the road. We were blocked. We were just waiting in line. <laughs> and um, we were in line for a long time. <laughs> and all their caravans came up. They in the back of the line, not our fault. Tell this guy, move it, we all go. Um, so you kind of see that in the videos and such too, but basically what began to push from there was just people's hearts came out. Um, you saw the change from down below to up there, because we know we're in Vawakua. We're technically not even supposed to be up here. But if we have to be up here now, then our presence needs to be Pono. Um, and so the best language is the language of our Pule, and our chants, and our, ol, our Oli, our Hula. All of that began to come forth. And then we tried to dialogue. We saw Billy Kinoi come out, let's all go! Yeah, whatever. <laughs> you know, he just wasn't listening. He wasn't listening. It was just all this circle talking. Um, and eventually there was a move on their on his part they said you know what okay we're gonna leave and we thought they're all leaving no he was smart he removed all state all state county officials all left we never we thought they're in the process of them leaving we never see some of the TMT workers actually going up to vehicles um, past us and then driving ahead so that's when we actually began to make our way on foot um, over to the TMT site uh, then that's when the fun little action happened where I really met brother Kaho <laughs> Okahi. Um, I got hit by a car and he helps. He was the only one of some of the brothers who was slamming to the truck because I was stuck in the hood. So <laughs> that'll wake you up. <laughs> and I was really pumped up and started making my way over to the site um, after they stopped the vehicle. And I made my way over, I don't, I don't even remember how I got there, I didn't know where it was. Um, and then, once I finally found the site, it's all blank from there. You know, Akua, I really feel, lifted me across all that pohaku for get up there. For some reason, I guess I didn't have to breathe, I'm just go. And then from there, you can see the video, you know, just let Akua speak. Let our kupuna speak. And that's what I felt. You know, in the state, every, you know, I think we've all been in that part where you just start speaking and you don't even remember what you said because it's not you speaking. You know, kupuna really began to speak. Um, it was very high emotions that day. A lot of people have missed, uh, mixed feelings about how that went down. But what it did do is it, it did stop the ceremony. Yeah. We even were kind enough to help them pack up their chairs. <laughs> Get off the mountain. Um, but that presence of Aloha, I think, really, really changed the, the ball, the playing field up there. You know, they're they're prepared to deal with angry people. 
They all got their zip ties. They're ready for it. But how do you deal with people who are quote unquote behaving and belong in that space doing what what is pono? They don't know how to deal with that. They were not makaukau for that. Um, and so all that whole day, we stopped, you know, held them off for five hours and then closed their ceremony. They all left. No one got arrested. For us, that was proof in the pudding right there that there's a tactic. There is something to this. It's a way of, really, of truly falling in the ways of our kupuna and respecting the kapu of the mauna, the kapu aloha. Um, and so that was that day. And now it comes to about 26 days ago, 27 days ago. Today is one month. So one month ago, wake up 7 o'clock in the morning, get a text message, uh, tractors are moving up the mountain. Kupuna just told me, get up and go. So drove straight up on the mountain. Uh, got as far as Pohale Pohaku and they had blocked the road. Um, the road was closed. And so I said, well, that's why I was giving feet. And I started walking. They tried to stop me several times, but I just kept going. Uh, ended up walking for two and a half hours. Got over 12,000 feet. Um, already saw their trucks coming down. So it was the Eha that knowing that the tractors are up there. At that time, you know, um, I guess they opened the road. Uh, Ohokahi was one of, and a few others. Hana came on up. We went to the site and kind of, kind of engaged dialogue with the security guard that were there. We realized, okay, but in our Koleana, we need to come and start watching over this mauna. So we had this was on a Tuesday, so we had set to come back on the Thursday to start uh, keeping visual on the mauna. We didn't get that chance to hold Makaukau because the next morning I got a call. The tractors are moving and they're pushing. Flew up there again, and this is the one. If you got to see some of the footage when I was actually asking them, where's your cultural monitors? Where's your archaeologists? Just calling them out on these things. And it worked, because their archaeologists and their, their peeps wasn't there. Um, <clears throat> so right there you saw they actually packed up and they left. Um, and from that day, there's, from that day, from right there, there's been a 24-7 vigilance and presence on the Mauna, um, keeping a watch over the Mauna. Um, and it just started from there. We just put the word out, the kahea to our people, you know. Hey, this is, we are at this point. We're not beating around the bush anymore. They're here. The tractors are on the mountain. All we need to do is leave and our the pohoi hoi will be ripped up. It is going to start. Um, and mind you too, this is already, they're already almost a month behind because the actual original date when the tractors were supposed to be moved up there that we were all we were all aware of was the day that Poliahu came and the mountain was covered with a thick layer of snow and particularly in this area where they're about to dig the snow was seven feet deep oh, yeah. so that's what I want to kind of speak to is the matter of the Ho'ailonas that we have been seeing in this you know it's it, it, our kupuna and our akua are paying attention in that spot the snow was so deep seven feet because they were, they were pushing that day they actually just pushed the snow to dig it out and when I went walking down there the snow was, was whoa thick um, but it was perfect too because prior to that I had really hooky hooky as to a, how, what do I do we were still in Makahiki I was like I can't I can't engage in this it's Makahiki and then the snow came Palinamauna just long enough we just finished our Makahiki all rose our ku and boom the snow opened up to the point that they were able to bring the, um, the tractors up. So the way things have been aligning right now is be, it's not just coincidence. Our kupuna are setting it up. And for me, when our kupuna are setting it up, that means we better be makoka, we better move on it. Yeah, because they are making ready for us in that realm. So even up into the movement now, everything just seems to be falling into place. Our people are waking up, our people are seeing the collective, um, how do you say, the sense of unification. This is the, one of the biggest unifications oh, I definitely, I've ever seen of our people. And, you know, I feel it's because 
This is the last straw. Mauna Awakya, in the tradition of our Kupuna, that is the Pico of Hawaii. Everything that is our culture is because of this Mauna. It's the Mauna that our Kupuna first saw that brought them here. Yeah? It is the foundation of Wakea, making, um, coming to this Mauna and establishing itself that made us now stay the birth of the Kanaka of the Hawaiian on these islands. Um, so, with this, if they're able to do this, they're able to do anything. Yeah. This is the Pico, the highest of the high. Yeah. And they've already had their chances and they've already got onto there. They've already infected the Pico. So with this now, enough is enough. And we need to be makaukau. We need to get ourselves ready and conduct ourselves at our highest potential. The kapu of aloha that we hold on the mauna, that we are asking everyone that is connected to the mauna and wants to speak to the mauna to conduct themselves in that same manner, that has been both our shield and our spear. If we came in there aggressively the first day, we would all be gone. Now here we are a month later and our encampment still stands. In fact, we're really good. We, we're good friends with all the rangers. We're good friends with all of the police officers. That's quite different. But it's because we're recognizing that a cup of aloha it gives us patience and compassion to understand these brothers that are coming to arrest us and these sisters that come to arrest us. We have to look deeper. Now we cannot just look at them on their surface because that's only one part of the story. When we look at them when they were coming to arrest us, what I saw was cuffs on them. They're not allowed to follow their na'au. They're not allowed to follow their heart. Do your job, arrest these people. So who really is a prisoner? Yeah. Yeah. And when they say Ohana, serious Ohana, one of the brothers walking in the line with us, his dad was one of the officers that came. Could you imagine the hooky hooky there? So we have compassion, understanding about this. It's a new, it's a different way. I know it's much different um, and it's very hard. And we've been questioned up and down. What is this kapu aloha thing? Right now, it's proof that it's working. Because here we are, one of the biggest gatherings and unifications of our people. And yet even the day on the arrest, if you watch the arrest, 31 people arrested on the Mauna. Not one cuss word. Not one fist raised in anger. None of that. Maybe that's what we needed to see in order to spark and get everybody moving. But that we respect the traditions of our kupuna so much that we would not even allow that to sway us. On the Mauna, is the most sacred, one of the most sacred peoples of Hawaii, how do you conduct yourself in a sacred way? We didn't allow ourselves to turn our light off, yeah, to engage with these. We stayed in our light and it's become infectious. Yeah. A positive infection, keeping the light on for everyone. That's what's opened this up truly, the attention of the world. We have the whole world watching us right now. And like our kupuna told us, I remember our kupuna telling me when I was young, there's gonna, that day is going to come where the world is going to look to Hawaii to learn what aloha is. So now we have the world's eye. We better be the prime models of what aloha is. And again, we're not talking about just the gushi gushi lavi dabi aloha. <laughs> so again, that's only one aspect of that word. But everything that aloha represents. Aloha is a way of thinking. Yeah? To acknowledge one's breath of life, alo to alo. To see everything that they are, to understand everything that's happening, and then make a, a decision how to engage with one. It's hard. It's super, super hard to do. Believe me, I've been tested several times in the Mauna. But having this couple, that I am holding myself to abide by, 
keeps me in check. Soon as I start to waver, okay, pull me back in. That's what a kapu is. A kapu is a standard that is set. We decide what standard we want to set for ourselves. So we're setting the bar high. And it's to conduct ourselves at our highest level, highest potential, to speak well, to speak truth. In this movement, one of our greatest things is we don't hide nothing. We keep hearing TMTs actually, as we're hearing from the community, people have been approached by TMT with big dollars for come up and infiltrate our camp and get dirt on us. You can just go to YouTube and you're gonna find out everything we put. <laughs> There's no secrets. We're operating completely, completely in the light. So it's harder for them to touch us. What are they gonna do? We're speaking from our heart. We're speaking from the out. We're speaking from Pono. And that has been one of the most beautiful things um, about this movement. As I say too, if we're really looking forward to building a nation, how will we build that nation? Will it be a nation founded upon just legalities and policy, or like many nations founded on war or bloodshed? I don't find that to be very honorable. For myself, if we're gonna build a nation, I will be part, I'll be proud to be part of a nation that builds itself on truth, on love and respect and true unity. So, Mauna Awakea started off as trying to stop a telescope development on a sacred place, but it's becoming the opportunity for Kanakas to step it up. And we gotta take full advantage of this opportunity. So with this, we actually say, Mahalo TMT for giving us a good reason to step it up. So, Mahalo Nui no Kako, Aloha. Aloha mai kako, wau ho, no okai kanuha, no holo loa kona mai au. Andre just asked us to come up and kind of give a little scoop on, I guess how we started this, how we how it how it all started. Um, so Alana Kila pretty much covered everything, but I can talk a little bit, some fill in little bit stuff um, for my part. Uh, I was up here. I was living on Oahu for 13 years, from seventh grade until Paul College. I graduated from the University of Hawaii Manoa in 2013 with my bachelor's in Olelo, Hawaii. In my last semester of college, I was taking an ethnic studies class with um, Paul Kai McGregor. And the, the, the project for the semester was to cover and research a current land issue in Hawaii. Um, so being from Hawaii Mokupuni, obviously I wanted to do an issue that was on my Mokupuni because I knew that as soon as I graduated, I was going back home. And so at that time, and at this time as well, there's probably no greater land issue in Hawaii than Mauna Wakea. So that's kind of how I got uh, involved in it, as far as you know, just kind of going through the comprehensive, the master plan, the, um, all of the studies that they did, looking at the lease agreements and things like that, and seeing just how ridiculous it was. Um, and so when I came back home, you know, I was a little bit aware of what was going on. So, but I never really got physically involved until the October 7th. Uh, attempt at groundbreaking and the blessing. Um, and like Lanakira said, we went down there for, for Pule. That's all I knew. Um, I was actually here on Oahu on those days. Uh, I, I teach Hawaiian Medium Preschool, Pula Nalea Okona. And so we were on Oahu for staff training. Um, I had a feeling, it's like somehow the, the training is going to be on the same day. And it was, uh, training was Monday, Tuesday, and I think the groundbreaking was on a Tuesday. So I worked it out with my, with my uh, Luna that I can only be there for one day, then I gotta go, I gotta go back home. I gotta go have Kuleana on the Mauna. I don't know what that Kuleana is, but I know I get Kuleana over there, I gotta be there. Um, so we went there, and like Lanakila mentioned, it was Pule, it was all my Kai, and then we got word that, hey, some guys, we can go up. We're gonna, we're gonna go up. Okay, let's go up. Um, and we got there, and uh, it was a life-changing experience really for me. 
because uh, you know there's a lot of there's a lot of these attempts at protests and stuff like that. And sometimes, a lot of times, it's just to kind of get your message across. Yeah, you go to sign, people hear about it, people see about it, and and that's all. But that was actually one of the um, kind of like one of the first in a long time where the the purpose of the protest was actually fulfilled. Yeah, it was to stop them from. Not, not from blessing it, but to stop them from breaking ground, from taking that OO and putting it into the Honua. Because the symbolism of that is that that's the first step of construction or destruction, yeah, and desecration. So we don't like them even get started. We're gonna stop them from the very beginning. Um, and as everybody knows that day, we're able to stop them. Uh, like Lanakila said, I met him on the truck as we was both sitting on the hood uh, by one of the, the park rangers. We go right up to him. You know, not you know, not 45 mile an hour kind, but at a decent speed, and and I saw him stand in the road with zero fear and and just cool. And he and the guys in the the truck, the windows rolled up and everything, and he stood right there and he said cool. And the truck came up to him and bumped him, jump on top. I was right behind him. We got there and. Uh, we, so we were on the hood and the, the truck actually continued to go, continued to drive. And so we end up back on the ground, we're holding off, we're getting backpedaling a little bit. And in the spur of the moment, we're not really thinking about, you know, okay, what's the, what's the best strategy here? We just get in front of the truck thinking that they would stop. Um, we never stopped. And so we had some other, some other guys um, who saw that. They ran up, they jumped ahead, and they lied in the middle of the road. And the, the truck went right up to them and stopped right before them. And so we, we stopped that. Lanakila went ahead and, and ran up to the top of the, to the mountain, down to the site, while the rest of us kind of held a line because there were other trucks behind who were going to attempt to go through. And so I went out, if you're not going to let us through, then we're not going to let you guys through. If anybody deserves to be there, it's the Kanaka. Um, and so, like I said, you know, we, we stopped it that day. Yeah, through a collective effort, we were able to stop the groundbreaking and the blessing. And so from that point, I knew that, okay, now we have a kuleana to stop this whole project. Because if we can stop the blessing, then we gotta stop the project too. Because if we don't plan on stopping the project, they might as well let them do the blessing. Yeah, so that things can go perhaps as good as possible, as pono as possible. But again, the mindset is that this is not gonna happen. We're not gonna allow it to happen. So from that day forward, I knew that the time was gonna come where we're gonna have to make some sacrifices and we're gonna have to give some things up to protect what we consider sacred we know is sacred um, and so like he mentioned it was a Tuesday I don't remember the date it seems like three years ago already but it's back in March um, and he, he texted me at 7 o'clock in the morning Chuck is going up the mountain um, and like I mentioned I, I teach I'm a teacher I teach preschool um, so in that situation fortunately the pool is only small and you get nine ohana um, that's an unfortunate situation all the time, but on that day it was actually fortunate. So, I don't have the authority, uh, I'm just a teacher, I don't have the authority to close the school. Um, but I do have a phone, and I get everybody's number. And I call all the Ohana one by one, explain the situation, and they know, because we've been talking about it in, in Pula, in Halawai, often. This is what's going on in Mount Makeo. And we had a lot of those Ohana actually join us on the day of the, the groundbreaking. So I told them from the, you know, consistently, Hey, when, when this starts to go down, don't be surprised if you guys lose a coup. Yeah, and, and with, with all respect, and not, not joking about it, but that's just the seriousness of this, of this situation. So at 7 o'clock, I'm actually on my way to work, driving, I get the text. Oh, what am I going to do? I got to be there. I know this is my kulana, I knew this since October. And so, I get on the phone, I call each ohana one by one. Aloha, you know, roka gayaka, hope things make ba'i. Uh, I don't have the ability to close the school, but I will ask you all politely, would you mind taking the day off? <laughs> would you guys mind keeping your keiki at home? And, and luckily, um, every ohana agreed to. They all kept their keiki home. So, if no more kids at school, then you can leave, huh? So, <laughs> about five minutes before school is even supposed to start, I got confirmation everybody wasn't coming. And that some of them were actually planning on joining us on the mountain. So, went home, uh, changed clothes a little bit, not knowing how the weather was going to be, and got up to the mountain. By the time I got to the mountain, it was about 10 o'clock. Lanakila has got there already. Um, Kuipo Freitas, 
was actually another Puma at our Pula. She got the word too, so she was up there already. And they had started walking. Uh, I got there, Lakia Tras was at the, at the, um, the roadblock because they had blocked the road and they weren't allowing us up, which is why Lanakila and Puipo decided to walk. So knowing that they were walking and not knowing how far ahead they were, the two of us decided, okay, we're gonna wait down here because the guy was telling us that the road will be open pretty soon. So we're gonna wait down here, that way we can drive up and we can at least give them a ride back down. Um, that day, there was probably about 15 of us on the mountain by the end of the day. Uh, we had some, some conversations with the security guards, kind of figuring out, okay, what's the scoops? Um, trying to figure out, okay, what are our options? What can we do? What can we not do? What's being monitored? What's not being monitored? What do they know? What do they not know? And so talking with the security guards that day, they were in front of the construction site. And we've seen that four, four machines had been set up on the construction site already. And so, you know, Trevor, get the scoops, asking them, oh, you know, what's your guys' schedule? You guys here 24-7? Or you guys, you guys leave night time? Uh, they told us that they're here 24-7 and their only kuleana is to protect the machines, to make sure no harm is done to those machines. That was their only kuleana. That's all they could do. And then about an hour later, all of a sudden their kuleana was to monitor vehicles too. And they say, no, you guys kind of have your cars here. You guys got to move it. So we told them, right, that's not you guys' kuleana. You said your only kuleana is to protect the machines and they're protected at this point. So they left it at that. About an hour later, they start threatening us. Okay, if you guys don't move the trucks, we're gonna tow it away. And so, what we saw was again they explained to us what their kuleana was. So they just tried to kind of gain power over us, trying to give us demands that they know they have no authority to do, and they like see us uh, conform to what they want. And so all of us told them, do what you gotta do. You gotta call the tow truck. Call the tow truck. But there's no signs over here. There's no authority. Uh, forcing us to move it. You guys said your kuleana is only to protect the machines. And so we were there that day for from 10 in the morning to about 5 in the afternoon and we decided that we're gonna you know for lack of a better word we're gonna occupy the space. We're gonna we're gonna shut it down. Yeah that's where that TMT shutdown hashtag came from. We're gonna shut the TMT down. We're not gonna let them go through with this. Um, so we decided let's all go home, let's get one more day of rest, one more day of, you know, get one last good ao ao in, and then we come up on Thursday morning, uh, which was Kuhio Day, yeah, ironically. Um, we'll come up, we'll come together, and we're gonna, we're gonna stop this. Then the very next morning, at the same time, we got a text again from London Kilo Machines, are working. And so that was a huge hooky hooky for me, because already the day before, I would ask Auto Ohana, yeah, no come school. And as much as I wanted to do that again, I know that I, I couldn't. I kind of sacrificed and, and compromised the integrity of the pula. So that was a hard day for me. It was the longest day of the week too. It's a Wednesday, so we get parent class afterwards. So it was basically a seven to seven day. Um, but as soon as work was done, I went straight up the mountain. Didn't even think about it. Went to the mountain in shorts, t-shirts, slippers, nighttime. Oh, within two hours, I couldn't feel my feet. Um, <laughs> but. Uh, luckily, we had some other people there. There was about seven, us, seven of us there that night. Lanakila and I, Kuipo, uh, Krista Allah, Lena Allah, her mom, and that was about it. Started off with a group of seven people, and um, but we put the call out. Okay, tomorrow holiday. That's why we chose that day because we wanted to start off our stance with a solid number of people. Yeah, I know they come in with, with eight guys and you know it doesn't seem like this is a this is a situation and um and a movement that everybody doesn't want to be a part of. We wanted to show that okay, we're united on this, we fought on this, we're gonna come with a solid force. And so for the first day we probably had about 60 people or so, which in our mind at that point was good. It was right on. You know, short notice. Um, but the TMT folks never came. They never come that day, they never come the following day, they never come the following day, they never come the following day. Monday they came and on that day again our numbers weren't, weren't great probably around 60 to 70 people but we were able to hold them off on the road for eight hours yeah, they, they, they work union good fellow yeah construction union so they got a strict schedule they work seven in the morning till three in the afternoon um, and of course you know we get a lot of guys working construction so we get that information but they gotta also come earlier because they cannot just shoot it straight up the Mona. They gotta stop, they gotta acclimate. 
because um, there's a lot of people who get altitude sickness and dizziness and things like that. So we kind of anticipated that they'd be coming anywhere between 5.30 and 6.30. So for, those, for all of those days, we were going to sleep at like 1 in the morning because we're on edge. You don't know, you know we don't know any, any stuff is going to come or not. And we were going to sleep at 1 o'clock in the morning. We're waking up at 3.30. Yeah, we just because we cannot heal it, we cannot trust, we don't know what they're gonna do. Every time when Carl would drive through in the middle of the night, everybody wake up. You look, you start looking, you look to the side, the other guy in his car stays sitting up too, the car over there stays sitting up too. So we're all on edge, it was real uh, restless nights. And so they came up that Monday, they got there about 6.15 in the morning. And that was one of the the better feelings of my life, I think. Yeah, because they came full force. All their cars, all their officials, all the construction workers, and a boatload of, of Maka'i, of, of policemen. I'd say at least 40 officers, they came that day. And, and we made a line. And we poop up. And we didn't allow them through. Um, and, and that energy there was just, was amazing because again we didn't have choke people yeah the, the police could have taken us out easily guaranteed a couple hours at the most Paul um, if they really wanted to they could have taken us out in, in an hour at the most but um, we handed them some documents that day and, and that day and again you know we don't know what's gonna work because um, everything they're doing is illegal anyway everything they're doing is flawed the process has been flawed from the very beginning but we figure if we can provide them with some documentation and if you know, they're not just dealing with some ignorant people, that there are, this, this, this is a movement that's going to be at least a little bit founded on education yeah, and, um, and knowledge. If we can provide them with some documentation, maybe we can hold them off for a little while. So that day we actually provided them with the, with the press release that had come out a few days, uh, a few days before that, um, acknowledging the fact that judicial notice was taken in the Maui court case with the Maui fishermen. And so we provided them with the written mandamus as well which is a 165 page document and explain to them that you know they lack jurisdiction and all this kind of stuff uh, all the stuff that we know and again not really with the money all that it would stop them but hopefully that for a little bit of time it could, it could buy us some time yeah it could buy us some time because the whole thought process in this is that we're not going to stop them in one day not going to stop them in one week one month maybe not even one year this is a 1.4 billion dollar project they got money coming from coming out of the nose coming out of the ears they got money all over this and so what it's going to take is a consistent effort is a, a the ability to delay them delay them delay 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 and over time the money's going to add up yeah and even though it's even though it's 1.4 billion dollars in some senses it's only 1.4 billion dollars that can run up eventually yeah it's not everlasting it's gonna it'll come to an end and so if we can provide delays to them. That, that's kind of our strategy. Over time, it'll frustrate them. It'll become a, a waste of time, waste of money, and we can get them to pull out. And so we provided them with those documentation. We had some, we had some discussions with the policeman, with Wally Ishibashi, who is the cultural advisor to the Office of Mauna Kea Management, uh, with Bob Breckman, who is the head of the archaeology team under ASM Affiliates. Um, the cultural monitor was there. And, and a few of us who had kind of been designated the spokespeople of the group. And so we had a conversation and, and we had a microphone too, we had a sound system. Because we didn't want them talking with just a small group of us. Because one thing that we've acknowledged this whole time is that this is not an organizational effort. This is not a hui thing, this is not a, a what group you're a part of. The only group that we're a part of is the la hui. Yeah, if you gotta give us a title, then we say, okay, then you call us aloha aina. There's no groups to this. And so we didn't wanna, we didn't feel it proper to just have a select few in this meeting. That it should be heard by everybody. And so we actually had a sound system on the mount, on the Mauna. And everybody who gave statements was able to do it onto the microphone and everybody else on the road who was blocking the road could hear it and respond. Uh, so our, our, our side, we all went around, we gave a statement, we explained to them how this is illegal, how this is improper, how this is not adhering to the, the eight criteria, it's not adhering to the laws of occupation and international law, it's not adhering to, it's not recognizing the rights of the people, and, and it's detrimental to the Aina. So we go ahead and do all that kind of stuff, and it comes to their turn to give their statement, because we were told that this is going to be a meeting, 
We're going to have a hollow way. We're going to exchange documentation. They're going to provide us with the contracts. They're going to provide us with the statements and all those kind of stuff so that we can, we can double check all of those things. And in turn, we're going to provide them with our documentation. We gave them ours. They gave us nothing. Wally Ishibashi went ahead and, and his statement was very short, straight to the point. He said, we respect you guys, Manao, but this is not up to us to decide. This is for the courts to decide. And, and we all know, never worked for us. Never has. And as long as we stay in this system, it never will. And so, um, we didn't accept that. He passed it on to the, the archaeologist who had said that he would um, share some dialogue with us and discuss with us. And all he said was, off the microphone, I have no comment. And that was the end of that. So from that point, we went ahead and we discussed with the policemen. But you know, um, that whole day, they got there at 6.15 in the morning. We held them off on the road. They stayed on the road. They never go home early. They stayed there until 2.51 p.m. in the afternoon. Yeah, nine minutes before Paul Hana. And at that point, they started moving and they turned around. And the energy among the people was incredible. People started chanting, people started singing. And that was one of the, you know, in my short lifetime, that was one of the greatest moments of my life. Yeah, that, that at least for one day, even though it was only one day, a small group of people was able to put a stop to a project that's backed by five countries and $1.4 billion dollars with the assistance of the police, with the assistance of DLNR and DoCare and all of those people, we were able to stop them. You know, although only for one day, but that was a, that was a good start. Yeah, could get, can I get off to a better start than that? The following day, they didn't come. The following day, they didn't come. And then Thursday, they came. And that's when all of the arrests were made. And also on, on those days, we still had about maybe, i say, 60, 70 people, max. 31 arrests were made. Yeah, so just about half the group, about... Uh, I was arrested that morning as well. I was part of the first group taken out. And uh, Lana Kila and I had discussed that, you know, one of us can get arrested, one has to make sure we stay on the mountain. So I told him, okay, I go first. I'll get arrested first, you can go tomorrow. Um, and so I got taken out with the first group, and it was pretty quick. Got taken out about 7.30 in the morning. You now only half an hour after I was supposed to start work. So that was a huge uh, disappointment, you know, that was, that was too easy. That was too easy, that was too fast. Um, and there's 12 of us. And so at that time, we had discussed, we had a hollow bite, who's willing to get arrested? Whoever's willing to get arrested, let's go to the side, let's figure out, make sure we get bail money, make sure we get plans, all that kind of stuff. And so we had only basically 11 people who said we're willing to get arrested. And so they took all 12 of us out that, at that point. So as they're taking us to the cars, we're thinking, they're gonna do work today. They're gonna do work today. And as we're getting walked down to the paddy wagon, there's a small uh, group of kiki from Alokeho Aina Mauna, Hawaiian Charter School in Waimea. And they were chanting to us as we were taken out. They were watching us and they were chanting to us. And, and that was a powerful moment too. Yeah, because there's, a, there's Makua and Ohana who didn't try to censor this from their keiki. They exposed them to it. And the keiki were there and chanting. Chanting for those of us who are being taken away, which most times would, um, would portray a negative image, yeah? Something you don't want your keiki to go through and support. But they were there, they were chanting. And we got taken into the room, we could hear them chanting the whole time. And all I could think about the whole time was, they're going up to the mauna and they're going to start doing destruction. And so it was a real tough half hour or so. We get put in the car, we're getting taken away, and we're looking out the window, and as we pull onto the road, we see that the line of cars had progressed up the Mauna, but that they were being blocked again. There was a whole group of people a little further up the Mauna that had been blocked, and so that was an awesome feeling to be kept taken away and see that, okay, they never get there yet, and they're not gonna get there. And so we're able to hold them off for six hours that day. Um, they did go ahead and do some work, I think it was about two to three hours. But up until this point, from the day that we first started there, Today makes one month, four weeks to the day. And in these four weeks, they've only been able to do about three hours of work. So not even an hour a week. And so again, that's, that's gonna build up. It's gonna, um, it's gonna accumulate. Yeah, and every day, they're losing money. Every day, they're losing time.
time in this race for the largest telescope in the world, even though we know that Chile already has two telescopes that are going to be larger than this. Um, but that's how it started. And from that day, the very next day on the Mauna, we had over about 300 people. Yeah, those arrests ignited the people. It sparked this, this i'ini, this ahi inside of everybody's na'au to go ahead and be a part of this. And that was one of the big uh, huki wuki Because for me, I was determined. Yeah, I, you know, I don't want to get arrested. But if it comes down to it, I, I go and get arrested. That's what it takes. Um, but there were some people who were trying to convince us that that's not a good idea. It's going to scare people away. What's the point of that? All they do is take you off the mountain and now they can go ahead and do work. But I was sure that if we could stay in the Kapuolo and if we could continue to do this in a proper way, that it would ignite our people. And I think what we've seen since then, in my estimation, is the greatest activation, mobilization, and unification of the Hawaiian people since 1897. Yeah? And so, um, that's something that it, it did spark something. Um, and since then, the, the presence has been consistent. 24-7, some nights we get 60 guys staying over. Um, and it continues to get stronger. We continue to get more numbers. We continue to get more people. And so, all of these strategies of... Because what we think is that they're not... The first moratorium, when they came on, they said it was kind of in respect for the Merry Monarch. It wasn't in respect for the Merry Monarch, it was in fear of the Merry Monarch, because who comes with the Merry Monarch? Hula dancers, cultural practitioners, Kanaka, yeah, who all hold this Mauna sacred. And so I think what they thought they could do is they could stall, delay, and this ahi, this iini, this desire would fizzle out, and the people would slowly start to separate, start to go back to, to real life. But they were greatly mistaken. And throughout the week, numbers started to grow. Numbers continued to grow. And so, I'm not sure what their tactics are, what their purpose is, but any efforts to slow this movement down and to stall momentum and, and kill the progress that's been made has failed, has absolutely failed. And the numbers up there continue to get stronger, continue to get new people, and I'm confident that um, we'll stay on that path. So, Kalamai, that's kind of the long version of the, the couple minutes I thought I was going to talk up here. Um, we'll be back up here later, but that's how everything got started. So, mahalo nui. Mahalo. Thank you. We are live right outside Oha headquarters, Gentry Pacific Center, 560 North Nimitz. Aloha. Aloha kaho. If, if we can, we're going to uh, do a quick rearrangement of our, our seating real quick. Because of the, the echo and the sound, and uh, we don't have a huge amount of people, we want to kind of get it a little more intimate. So if we could ask uh, people to come closer. My, my, come closer, we're going to arc around to this side. We've got a lot of room on this side. Aika, can we move that table forward and to the left and take those two tables and connect them together? And then Kaleko's table, we can bring closer. Uh, can we? Can you guys come on this side? Come a little bit closer. We make one hawaka. Yeah, right here. Show you uh, um, where we are. We're yeah, rearranging the space right now. We've got a lot of space for people. So as you can so see, it's under out. roof, and it's uh, we're right outside the uh, Oha okay. offices. We have. So. Uh, may I? We have food. If uh, anybody's hungry, right here on my right side. We got a table with um, some melai and some drinks on this side. For the bathrooms, uh, you gotta use the lua. Here to my left, there's a hallway. On the door, there's a little touch uh, code. And taped to the Stay door here. is a yellow piece of paper that's taped that and has a code. A lot of people so far. So We're uh, ready side. to stay uh, all night until uh, tomorrow's have, OHA meeting uh, at 12.30. Mana. Good friend of mine composed a song. They couldn't take the mana. Uh, we have Kalekoa coming up soon, uh, and we also have Uncle Palanivan in the house. Um, while we while we rearrange, um, kind of want to tell you guys a quick story about how uh, how I came to be involved. Um, I wasn't involved in Mauna Kea at all. I was involved in sovereignty, politics, and organizing. And um, 
Mauna Kea was always on the peripheral, and some of my teammates in our group, Mana, really were already working on Mauna Kea, organizing on the, um, the contested case hearing and the, the court case, and, and um, we just really weren't able to find a clear kuleana, yeah? and Mana, we had, although we had people from Mana working on it, just Mana as a whole hadn't really committed. And a lot of that was because, um, well, for me personally, I, I just didn't see where I fit in. And I don't know. I don't know what to do about uh, contested case hearings or court cases. Yeah, I'm. I can. I like to work more logistics, uh, street organizing. But when this thing blew up, as they just told us, and then we had the arrests, yeah, 31 arrests. Then we started to realize, oh. We get in critical mass. We get in this thing that all of us have dreamed about, have organized and worked for, but really was never able to achieve. And it just happens the way it normally does, organically, um, this, this groundswell in response to people getting arrested. The day after the arrest, we're all excited, thinking about Mauna Kea. It's midnight. Friday night, sorry, Thursday night, Kalekoa calls me up at midnight and tells me, bro, we'll go Mauna Kea in the morning, we'll check them out, we'll call all these guys, let's get involved. And it really was this, uh, for me, the spur of the moment, uh, from really, I would say, zero involvement to, you know, admiration from afar, but not really seeing where I fit into this to a phone call at midnight, and boom, six o'clock in the morning, heading to the airport, and me and Kale Koa meet in Kona, we rent a car, we drive up to Mauna Kea, and there's this big rally going on, people's music and singing, and, and um, speeches, and Hawaiian flags everywhere, we're just like, wow, this is, this is what we've been waiting for. So, we spent two nights on the Mauna, me and Kale, we slept in the car, a little tiny rental car, sleeping in the sleeping bag. Um, and that's really how, how we got involved. Uh, that's how I got involved. Um, and I never really made that connection that I, and then until I went there and I seen and I was able to feel what this struggle was about and what we fighting for. And then I was able to really think about, and then it occurs to me when I'm on the mountain that my mom, my mom, my mom, Ivalani, was born in Homomu. And my Ohana comes from Homomu, yeah? And so then I started to think, hey, maybe I do have a kuleana, maybe I do have some position, connection to this Mauna. I certainly have a connection to helping people, helping our Lahui organize. So that's what happened. We had to up, we spent two nights on Mauna Kea. Um, we go up to the summit, we go to Lake Waiau, and we feel this mana that everybody feels and we realize as organizers as sovereignty organizers that one we got a sovereignty issue going on here there's no, no question about that this is kingdom land we got critical mass starting to form it's something that we always dream about and we have something to offer to them you know we, we want to call Kobo, um, all of these young Kanaka on the Mauna who are holding it down. So we're inspired, so we come back, and as is usually the case, we hit the ground running, we're organizing, and our whole world shifts over to Mauna Kea, just like everybody else, and here we are today. So that's a little bit about you know me and my connection, and um, I'm nobody. As I say, I'm, I'm just one a little bit less than average brother who um, has a lot of aloha for this. Is uh, Kanaka on the mountain. Um, so we can pull it in tight, guys. Come in, um, join us. Uh, coming up next, I think we'd like to break it up a bit, have some music. Um, can I call my brother Mana? Mana, you may come up, sing a couple songs, share some Mana about how you feel about this issue. Maybe talk about that song he wrote. They couldn't take the mana. They will never take the mana, yeah? Um, so I have my brother Mana come up and sing a couple songs for us. We got more speeches. I just seen we get our brother Kamahana Kealoha in the house. Aloha. 
um, they come together and uh, only bond together. That's how it looks, Mr. Muhammad. Okay, we're live uh, right outside uh, OHA offices where a group of people are going to be camping out and staying uh, all night until the 12.30 p.m. meeting of uh, OHA schedule for tomorrow at 12.30. Well, we got a set up, it's under roof. Uh, they're inviting people, it's safe, there's a lot of parking, the guards are, uh, know what's going on, they're down with it, so there's no kind of hostility, it's safe, there are kids here, women, a lot of uh, documenters live stream like me and uh, otherwise, so. Got a, a PA system set up. Musicians in the house. Aloha, my kako. Aloha. Uh, my name is Mana Kalina Nikatheris. I'd like to thank Brother Andre for uh, inviting me here to share some music, share some manao, and more importantly, to come here and just soak in this uh, this ike and this iini that that is being shared here with everybody this evening. Big mahalo going out to all the Kukia Imauna who are still upon the Mauna, who are two, especially to our two Kukia Imauna uh, leaders that are here sharing their mana with us today. Little connection I have with Mauna Awakea. My mom's genealogy comes from uh, Lillinois, and uh, I think it was a few years ago I was invited, uh, since our line does come from Mauna Kea, to uh, participate in a ceremony where we, it wasn't a reburial, more so of uh, covering up uh, some of our Ivi Kupuna that have uh, become exposed over the years due to the wind and the rain and the snow. So that was my first time up at the summit when we hiked up to Pu'u Manaka and uh, I think maybe 12 of us left. The archaeologist, I think he was trying to not let us go to the peak so instead of driving where we could have just hiked up the mile way up, he drove around the backside and we hiked four to five miles up the backside of Mauna Kea to Pu'u Manaka. So like I said, there was about 12 of us left the cars that day. Only two of us made the summit. Uncle Jimmy Maderos was the one who made it to the highest. I made it right to the bottom of, <laughs> of Pu Manaka. And uh, when I was there, I started to say Pule. And uh, I got to see Lillinois come up from nowhere. It was a clear, beautiful day. Then all of a sudden, I couldn't see within a couple feet in front of me. It was just that much mist in Lillinois up there. One of the greatest experiences of my life uh, uh, with nature, with myself. I got to learn about, learn who I am as a OEV, as a Kanaka Maoli up on that Mauna. So uh, I'd like to thank all of you here today to, who, who are sharing this, this uh, awareness. Um, like Lana Keela said, this is the last straw. This, there has to be something that we can all stand together and say, no, power it, enough. And this is it, this Mauna Kea, Mauna Kea, is where we all should stand side by side and say, power it, enough, no more. So with that, I'd like to play a little song I wrote in 1999, song entitled, Couldn't Take the Mana. At the time I wrote the song, it was about some of the things that I, that I saw that plagued our people, plagued the Kamaka Maoli. Them building hotels and digging up Ibi Kubuna. Them drilling holes through our Mauna and our Pumana. 
어디로 하나 But they couldn't take the man Another polka in the mountainside One more ball on road for a faster ride Where have all the fun always gone? Maybe you'll bring it back when you hear this song They took the land, they took Aloha Or they took the queen even though they didn't know her So press the and that cool boom broke the old hana But they couldn't take the manga But they couldn't take the manga I remember how things used to be My tutor used to say as I sat upon his knee Money, we didn't have a lot of things The only mound there we did was what you could cool bring Like the sunshine and the rain and the wind was so much stronger The life of the land must be forever long They took the land, they took the Aloha Or the queen even though they didn't know her So press the kaita, like a puna, broke the ohana But they couldn't take the manga Another Ohana must move away For better prices and lifestyle So they say Well where have all of our people gone? One day they will return and sing this song They took the land, they took the Aloha Or took the Queen even though they didn't know her so press the kaika and the kubunga broke the ohana But they couldn't take the manga But they couldn't take the manga They took the land, they took the aloha Over to the queen even though they didn't know her So press the kaika and the kubunga broke the ohana but they couldn't take the manga <laughs> Send that out to each and every one of you Who <laughs> can the moment Live right outside Ohe offices, Honolulu, Hawaii, 560 North Nimitz. We're going to be here my all night. More favorite. Mele. If I can remember one of the chords, but I'm sure you guys know the words, so please sing along. Hey, Hawaii.
I'll be back a little bit later tonight. We're here for the long call, so mahalo. Live uh, in Honolulu, 560 North Nimitz, right outside of uh, OHA headquarters in the mall. And it, it's uh, we're under roof, and we'll be staying the whole night. I don't know if I'll be staying the whole night because I gotta go work tomorrow. But uh, there's gonna be a lot of people here. We're gonna stay. Uh, Overnight until uh, tomorrow's meeting scheduled at 12.30, OHA Board of Trustees meeting, I guess it would be called. I got a new battery for this and it'll go nine hours. <laughs> it's going to last longer than I do. Um, we're using AT&T uh, cell bandwidth for my iPhone, so sorry, it gets, sometimes it gets kind of slow and you'll experience kind of low quality video. The last to go is audio though, so you should be able to get audio and there's a lot of interesting talk that's gonna go on tonight. We already heard about kind of the first few days of the uh, encampment and the arrests. Uh, here's Andre Perez, he's gonna well, uh, um, at this time, I'm going to call up uh, one of our MANA organizers, our MANA Wahine Nilima Long, to share with us um, how students are organizing around Mauna Kea to complement the occupation on the Mauna, and how we're trying to uh, do our student organizing here in the belly of the beast, yeah, the university who's really the decision maker on this. So if I could call up Nilima. Lima from Mana, Aloha. Aloha mai kako. Aloha. Check, check, okay. There we go. Okay, any college students in the house right now? Yeah, we've got a few of us, I see here from UH. So as we know, um, the Board of Regents of the University of Hawaii, they're one of the major decision makers in all of this. And about two years ago, um, students have been organizing at UH Manoa to bring light to this issue, um, to bring the issue out of the courts and back into the community by engaging students and community members in art and education, um, and a couple years ago, we did a nice mural at UH um, that told the mo'olelo of Papa and Wakea and Ho'oho'ukalani and Haloa and Mauna Awakea. And we decided to put a little message up next to our mural at UH that said, UH cannot be a Hawaiian place of learning and be leading the desecration of Mauna Awakea because the university does purport to be a Hawaiian place of learning. So it's in their uh, mission, it's in their strategic plan, it's in all of their um, fancy, pretty literature that they use to promote themselves, that they're a Hawaiian place of learning and they believe in the values of Ohana and Aloha and Ahupua'a and all of these things. So we decided to call out the contradiction at UH and we got back to school the next morning and that message was painted over. So we were like, all right, that's exactly what we wanted because now we can tell the students that our voices is actively being suppressed and we can start to bring students out and that's what we did. Um, students were upset that that message was, was painted over. They all came out, about 200 students. We were able to give further education on the issue um, on the university's role, on the contradiction of the university as a Hawaiian place of learning. And um, additionally, we were able to engage folks in the issue, which is really hard to do when it's contained in the courts. We don't speak that language, it's not meant for us, we can't make hearings, it's hard to follow. So we wanted to aloha mauna kea by engaging, re-engaging the community. And that's what we did two years ago. 
So now, um, we're starting to organize again, of course, as everybody is around this issue. And at the University of Hawaii at Manoa, um, the Native Hawaiian sort of uh, council for the university system called Pukoa Council came out with a statement opposing the TMT. So we brought that together um, with an art and education event around Mauna Kea and activism. Um, and then we also started a letter directed to the TMT investors um, and we circulated it around the University of Hawaii and other academic networks um, for professors, staff, and students of the university and student organizations to sign on to this letter um, opposing the TMT, laying out reasons why we oppose it, and urging the investors to divest because what we want to do is take that voice away from the university. The university has been so far the only voice and they've been saying that the official position of the university is that the university supports the TMT. And that's just not a fact. The fact is there's substantial opposition within the university, not even just the Hawaiian professors and the Hawaiian students. We have a lot of great conscientious professors and students that are sick of the corporate control of our lands, the corporate control of our government and of our policies and see this as a representation of that. So in a couple of days, we got 180 signatures and we brought that together at this event as well. So the Pukoa Council released their statement. We released this letter to the investors um, and we did it at this art event. We called a press conference and Pukoa Council called a, a university walkout for all student Native Hawaiian um, serving organizations. And at Manoa, a lot of people came out and the press was all there. And we were able to tell the press um, that Pukoa opposes this, all of these students oppose it, that there's substantial opposition within the university, and that that letter to the investors, that we were gonna use that as a starting point for organizing academia to put more pressure on these institutions like Caltech and University of California and its Canadian institutions. And as far as we can get, because all these academics, they all go to conferences, they all make friends, they all read each other's books, that whole sort of, um, hold on. <laughs> There are kids here, bring um, the kids down. There's a large progressive community in academia and we're gonna start organizing at that level as well. So professors are organizing and we're gonna try and put a lot of pressure. And we're inspired by the way that academia has organized um, the divestment and boycott campaign against Israel in support of Palestine. And we're looking at the ways that they've done that to um, help us organize at that level. Went to UH Hilo last Friday, of course, the Board of Regents meeting was last Thursday and there was a huge turnout at UH Hilo. And oh my gosh, we think we're the political ones over here at UH Manoa, right? And UH Hilo, they just like culture and language, right? That's how we always talk about them. But this Mauna is lifting up everybody's consciousness and is getting everybody involved and bringing us together. So there were hundreds of people at that Board of Regents meeting I went over Friday, we, we did a fun art activity, organized students more, got them to sign up. We're going to UH West Oahu tomorrow and doing a teach-in over there, educate about the issue, organize students, get folks to sign up. And what we're trying to do for the first time that I've seen or that I've known of is get students university-wide throughout the whole system to get organized so that we can tackle our kuleana, which is the university's role in all of this, together and in a unified manner. So those of you who have uh, family members at all of the CCs, we're gonna be hitting the CCs as well. And it's time to build a larger and unified student movement um, to put pressure on the university. That's what we're doing. Okay, so up next we have MC Andre Perez.
I'm moving around trying to find a MCR better connection. Back to the stage. I'm using uh, AT and T. But mahalo cellular. everybody for coming out. Um, this is also an organizing and it's opportunity. Eating up a lot. Further education, of, uh, and of course, we're here to put the pressure on OHA tomorrow. Um, we know that there's been efforts to not get this item um, as an agenda, as an action item, on the uh, agenda, which would give regents an opportunity to take a position and to take a vote. And we know that there are, I'm sorry, not regents, trustees. We know that there are trustees that want to support the protection of this Mauna. Um, and so those, the powers that be cannot be blocking that. Um, and we want OHA, you know, they have a responsibility to us, we're the beneficiaries, they have a responsibility to those who are protecting the mountain, and they have a responsibility, it's right in their mission statement, to perpetuate and protect um, the people and the land and those relationships. So we're here to hold them accountable, to hold them to that, and put on the pressure for tomorrow's meeting. I hand it back to Andre, mahalo. We along. We're live from uh, downtown Honolulu, Honolulu, right outside the uh, OHA offices where we are planning to stay all night until tomorrow's uh, OHA meeting at 12.30 p.m. Uh, I'm using... Can I tell us about the student movement? As many of us know, it's uh, oftentimes student movements that really create catalysts. If you guys remember Kent State, just joking, just joking. <laughs> um, at this time, uh, I'd like to call up one of uh, another uh, Kukia Imauna, um, one of our Mauna Kea organizers who has been doing a lot on the mountain, off the mountain, and all around the mountain. Um, Kamahana, Kealoha, come up and um, update us with uh, your work and um, some of your uh, analysis on what's been going on um, in the different arenas. We're going to mix it up, uh, having some of the different people involved in Mauna Kea, people who are organizing, people on the front line, people on the back line, people in between, people working uh, with social media. Um, everybody's contributing, and it's really awesome. And as Prada Kaleko said, we live, we live for this day, man, as, as organizers. Uh, and really to see critical mass, and um, really exciting. And I really hope that this struggle doesn't fizzle out. That it gets more tense. Yeah, we know if we know anything about organizing and activism, it means to get more tense, more tension before it gets better. Yeah. So if I could, uh, Kamahana, what's, tell us what's going on in uh, in your world. <laughs> yeah, come on up. Uh, if you like, uh, if you like, uh, drop this. And we are live using cellular bandwidth, so it gets a little shaky sometimes. And hopefully, uh, you're getting a clean audio. Mahalo for the mirror from Occupy Hilo Media. Hello to everybody on the Big Island. Hello to everybody. Moku o Keave. I got family there. Friends and family. Everybody watching will continue on uh, as long as we can and the power that we have. Everyone will be here overnight. Uh, it's a safe place, so if you're on Oahu, you can come down. There's a lot of parking outside. The guards are very friendly. They know what's going on. We're under roof. How are you folks doing tonight? Nice to see your faces, Hawaiian and not Hawaiian faces. I see a couple there. Um, some Kiai, I think we can consider you, of the Mauna. Um, my name is Kamahana, and I'm, I 
I see a lot of familiar faces, so Allah again to you folks. And the unfamiliar faces, I think there's very few, but Allah to you folks as well. I'm from um, Waimea, Hawaii Island. And Brother Mana, it's nice to see you, Brother. I've been here saying a long time. Oh boy, I think we're getting old. <laughs> Even though they say we're still young. <laughs> um, I think we're born into this kind of situation. I don't think we wake up one day and decide that, oh my goodness, we're occupied. I don't think we wake up one day and decide, oh my gosh, we gotta stop them on the mountain. I think we were, at least, I know I can speak for myself, when I say we're born into this, you know, we're born into this kuleana of um, having to defend not just our sacred areas like Mauna Kea, but to defend our civil rights as a people. And uh, I think even from the Kuei Petition Times in 1897, 1898, when they founded the Hui Aloha Aina, their two objects in their Hui Constitution that founded the Hui Aloha Aina was one, to seek political autonomy. But number two is what is very profound to me. Number two is seeking the upholding of the civil rights of all Hawaii citizens of the Lahui. And I think we're still looking for both objects to be fulfilled today. The Mauna, I, I've always known in my heart, was everything. That means jurisdiction. That means ivi kukuna. That means the question of sovereignty. Is it a question? Not to me. Um, that means environmentalists can jump in. Because what we're talking about is a violation of a conservation district. We're talking about a violation of human rights as far as our right to independence, our right to have our land deeds recognized. If Hawaii revised statutes take precedence from kingdom law, then how can they not uphold the clear, perfect title that our people have as, as a government to these lands of Humuhula and Kaohe, which is the two out I don't know if the word is Aupua, I believe it is Aupua, which is the two Aupua that meet on the Mauna. At one time, it divided in the middle between Humuula towards Mauna Loa side, the south side, I guess, Hema, and Kaohe to the north side. Um, now, I understand Kaohe encompasses the entire summit and over. And it is no coincidence, in my view of Hawaiian spirituality, that we have Kaohe homesteads being overrun earlier by Tutupele, and we have us on the Mauna, Mamaka Kaua, our spiritual battles, yeah? The spiritual warriors, different from Nakua. That's why our sister Hina back there, when she has brought us her mele, mele has been a driving force to uniting our people, even today. So, when Hina brought her mele and brought her kiki, well, they brought themselves, and they're not kiki anymore. But they brought their mele with her, and it says, Ku ha'ahel, to stand proud, yeah? My dear Hawaii, e ku Hawaii. Ma makakawa, spiritual warriors. O ka'aina, yeah? O ku'u aina, my beloved aina. A new day has risen for the next generation, and that's what we see with Brother Lanakila back there, and Brother Kohokahi. And I think we're still part of the same generation. I'm not sure how long that lasts, but we have Andre folks. It's kind of like, you know, we're still part of that. And I, I like to think of myself as within the 30 years of that generation. So what we have going on here, I think is unprecedented in my lifetime, being born in 1977. Um, having the aftermath of Kaho Olave, you know, all those, and they're still here, Allah, Allah, and the Olave, see you for them. But being born in an aftermath, you're born into this consciousness, yeah? And then to see it ebb and tide, and what we see now is, is a peak. What I decided when, when I realized the Mauna is going down on the Mauna is that, hey, the voice of my people from Waimea, the intergeneral teachings that we know of the Mauna needed to be represented, it needed to be at the table. So out of pure aloha, I decided to not step on anybody's toes, even though that, that's not what happened. And, and form a hui that we call the sacred Mauna Kea hui. We have been blessed. 
because we have gotten support from what I call the silent majority of, of our Hawaiian people. That means that they're unable to come out and feel safe to talk about the jurisdiction of Mauna Kea, to talk about how they feel. So I think part of my kuleana and the kuleana of the group, Sacred Hui, which by the way, if you just show up, you're part of the group, <laughs> was to nurture this idea of a safe place to come out and speak. So now you look around, and this is a collective work of not just what we do, but what everybody, what Mana has been doing, what um, Sacred Mauna Kea Hui, which is us, has been doing, what Mauna Kea Ohana has been doing, and we are one big Ohana. So I'm very happy that Lana Kila folks and Kahoa Kahi um, gave us the honor of once again helping to facilitate their needs, which this time was to come to Oahu and um, motivate our people. So there's plenty, there seems to be plenty of confusion from people outside looking in and saying, oh, get all these different kind of groups. But you know what? Well, what's the difference between us and every other country in the world when you're outside looking in? We're not allowed to have diversity. To me, the diversity of the people shows a sign of the intelligence of a people. So I commend everybody for stepping forward, wherever they may have stepped. Might be right outside of your house, you might have put a sign. But we know that now there's a safe place to bring this out in the public. For the people that still feel shackled because they work for OHA, or they work for the DNR, or they work for the military, or they work for the University of Hawaii. I know personally, because of our GoFundMe and their anonymous messages, that they really appreciate being able to speak, even if it's in that capacity, anonymously, and put their money where their heart is. And that is in um, maintaining the sacredness of our Mauna, the firstborn. Why is the Mauna sacred? I never learned this in one classroom. I never learned this from one book. I learned this from my intergenerational generational teachings from my tutu, Papa Sam, Kamuela. Kia Aloha. born 1901. He would take his kōpukupu up to the mauna, and as kids, we, we weren't allowed to go up there. We were taught that, that the puku, at the top, the piko, they used to call them the piko kaula naoka aina, the famous summit of all the land. Taking his kōpukupu up there, we weren't allowed to go because you're only allowed to enter the summit, the sacred summit, the home of the gods and goddesses for special reasons, yeah? Not just for the whole holo and small board, yeah? You access that area for spiritual reasons or to get everything is spiritual in the old Hawaiian world. Our, our religion is not secular, nature is God. Every manifestation of nature has a human characteristic that we assign to it and we call it God, right? So Christian or non-Christian, I think we can all agree that that God factor is everything and everywhere. So that certain sacredness that we hold the Mauna, my Mohana, and many others too, has to do with not entering the area, no human imprint. Just the fact that we gotta be there all the time now kind of makes me feel ano eh, yeah? that, that we gotta put aside our um, what we know of as our as a part of our spiritual beliefs to protect the Mauna, it's very ironic. So I just want to put that out there in your guys' mind, that when we're up there on the Mauna, these are the kind of things we're thinking about. The boys on the front line, the girls on the front line, they need all of our support. And I think, it, no matter how much confusion it causes, the confusion is not real. What is real is our diversity equals our intelligence. We have all these different groups out there trying to help. And I, my thing was to get that help to the front line. Make sure they have shelter. We know they get food, they get plenty of food, they get plenty of water. Make sure that if they need generators or whatever they need, that they get what they need. Because I think that's our kuleana. That, that pico means pico for all of us. I know some people on Oahu, because I've heard you guys talk, yeah? I live in Manakuli now. So I'm born over here. I was raised over there in Hawaii. But I hear people say, well, I don't know how to get involved because, you know, I don't, really, I don't really know if that's my kuleana. When we say, and I can tell you this, as an intergenerational cultural practitioner of the Mauna, that when we say that's our piko, that's all of our piko. Where is the only heiau existing today to Poliahu? Where is it? Nobody know. The only 
material that exists to pull it out. Anybody know? It's on Kauai. What does that tell us? Yeah? The Mauna, Rahale, the Pico, Kukahaula, the summit is her home. But the only heiau we know living today, I mean, around today, it's called Toliano, and it's on Kauai. That tells me, and that should tell you, that the Mauna is all about Kuleana, the whole Pai Aina from Hawaii to Kauai. That's your people. And I just want to offer that out. And you don't expect this kind of spiritual. The Mauna talks to you. I'm not going to lie, the Mauna talks to me. The Mauna don't talk in words. But push on my na'au. And I just want to share a mele that came from that interaction, that spiritual interaction with the Mauna. And I just, it's in Olelo Hawaii. It says, Aohea vale oya e poliahu, kawahine no hoa no ika, ike kua hivi. Ho ike maiana i kona lani, ike kapa ua kea i kama mani. Then it's revealing her beauty yeah, as the kapa that covers the nama mani forest at one time that we had there. Poni ia ke ala me ke o naana, ai hoa pili mau no ku aloha. So when I see that Ano Inue, to me, that's the voice of Polia. She's speaking to us. Exactly 
where I came from and how I did, how, who I am, and what I have to overcome and get over myself to do what I'm doing. And it was with honor that I, we received that money to be able to disperse it. So the 25K came to our group and we blessed and we're so lucky. I, I, I told her, I said, thank you so much for your charity and your aloha. And you know what she told me? It's not aloha and it's not charity. She told me it's my kuleana. I just want to leave you folks with that. Aloha Aina. We're live from uh, downtown Honolulu at the uh, OHA headquarters, right outside their offices. We're actually going to occupy this area until uh, tomorrow's meeting at 12.30 p.m. We're under roof. You can see this is kind of the opposite of being uh, camped out on the on the Mauna itself. Uh, it's too warm here, <laughs> uh, and we're near stores and stuff, so you know people don't have to bring stuff. I guess they can if you want. And there's a cafe downstairs that opens early in the morning. I hear that has good coffee. <laughs> But uh, this occupation will be all night. I don't know how late I'll make it. Uh, there's a lot of uh, talk and music schedule. A lot of musicians here. A lot of uh, people that have seen a lot. So stay tuned. And we'll just keep broadcasting as long as I can. I have an auxiliary battery on me. 12,000 uh, milliamp hours. So uh, it can last longer than I can. We're using AT&T cellular data, so the, it's a little bit shaky sometimes. If you can live stream, uh, come down. There's no such thing as too many live streamers. For the Manao update and the music. Um, at this time, I'd like to call up uh, Another one of our community organizers, long time organizers um, from Molokai, Uncle Walter Reedy, kind of talked to us, just briefly fill us in on what happened yesterday with their very successful march, um, where they went, who they talked to, and what happened. Um, as we all were watching um, via uh, social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, the march that they organized yesterday was extremely um, successful and really um, demonstrated how the Lahui can come together for Mauna Kea. Uncle Walter Rini, mahalo. Aloha kako. Aloha. Um, that march it took us years to, of planning and months of negotiations to have that march yesterday. It took about three days, I think, for us to decide we had to do something because we thought that the uh, showdown was going to be on Monday. So we wanted to have something action going on Tuesday. So we came up with this idea. And just to show you how powerful Facebook was, we didn't know what to expect because it was a work day and we didn't know if anybody was going to participate. We had a really good participation. So exactly what happened was we came to this building first and we expected some of the trustees to come to work, but only one showed up for work. And that was um, Isa Ahu, Ahu Isa. Yes, I gotta get used to these new trustees. So long story short, we started to shine the light on the, the trustee that is really turned this whole office around. This office was supposed to be against the telescopes, but because of Bob Lindsay, trustee Bob Lindsay, he flipped that and got the trustees to support the telescopes. So OHA came out looking like they're the ones that are going to be supporting the American government, they're the ones that are going to be supporting the state of Hawaii in this issue, even though the people are against this issue. 
So Oha started to look really well, I don't know I don't know if I should say Oha looked bad, but you could see the real face of the Office of Hawaiian Affairs. And that face was a face that is supporting the United States, and supporting the Democratic Party and all of the things that are happening in the state and not supporting the, the Hawaiians. So that became really apparent. So yesterday we tried to shine the light on that situation because tomorrow we're going to be demanding that they turn this around. Whether we're successful or not depends on the Chairman Bob Lindsay because he's really stuck in his position in support of this telescope. So after OHA, well, what we found out at OHA is that in this building, all of the staff, almost all of the staff, is on our side. They are on our side. It's the trustees that has political problems that they cannot overcome for some reason. So that's why OHA looks really bad at this point in time. Maybe we can all convince all of the workers in this building to do a, a workout or all walk out from work to show the OHA trustees that none of them support position of this Office of Hawaiian Affairs. We should encourage them to do that. That will be a rippling effect and maybe even the police won't come to the mountain anymore and the Hawaiian mayor won't be arresting anybody anymore. So anyway, that's just a pipe dream. So we went on to a second stop and the second stop was an important stop because that's Merchant Street. Nobody that I know of throughout all of these years had done a march on Merchant Street. We all believe that the power of the state is at the state capital. That is not true. The power of the state is on Merchant Street. And you can see all of their sacred buildings, those tall phallic symbols that they built for themselves. When we went down there, the first thing they told me was, you guys cannot come on our property, you can only stay on the sidewalk. And they said, we can only allow two persons into, into this building. And none of the media can go into the building. And it's all glass. And you could see all of their employees sort of like, the royal shutdown of this building in preparation of our arrival. So we said that two people, we have four people that we need to go into that building. We have a message that four people. So we started arguing, and I said, then you're gonna have to arrest a lot of people. But we can negotiate on four people. So we negotiated down to four people. And the four people delivered a message of support for Lanakila, and a message of support for Kanuha over there standing by the post. They and their lawyer delivered a message to the 23rd floor, which is the most powerful floor in the state of Hawaii. When Governor Ariyoshi last week had to do a press conference, he did it on the 23rd floor. When Senator Inouye died, his staff members now work on the 23rd floor. That's the golden floor. So the message was delivered to the golden floor regarding sovereignty. And somebody else is going to come up and talk about that. But we were there to support the two leaders from the Mauna and their efforts to warn Merchant Street that not everything in Hawaii is for sale. That there are things in Hawaii that are sacred and they cannot sell and buy and trade for our sacred places. So that's what Mauna Kea means to us. If Mauna Kea goes, everything goes. So that's the message we took to Merchant Street. Then we went to take a unification photo at Kamehameha statue. We crossed the street and went to the governor's office. The governor's office I guess in the football terms, he punted the ball, right? He punted out this whole issue and gave it back to TMT. He doesn't have anything to say about when they're gonna to go to work, if there's gonna be any arrests, 
it's all up to TNT. So the message we delivered to the governor's office was that we want the EIS process to reopen. In this issue, when all of these legal things were going on with the EIS, we were not really involved. The leaders were telling us, don't get involved in the EIS because it's a scam. It's a no-win situation, it's rigged. We, and you always lose in the EIS process. So the EIS process went the first step, we didn't participate. We're getting ready for the second step. In between the first step and the second step, two guys went up to the Mauna and they started blocking everybody and all hell broke loose in the Hawaiian community. So now we have people in the Hawaiian community that have their eyes open and they're caring about this mountain. So we figured that this EIS process, if we did it in the beginning, we would have lost. But now that we have thousands and thousands of people, not only in Hawaii, but in Japan and the mainland and all over the world that are concerned, we have an army that we can send to this EIS process. On Molokai, we use the EIS process and we stop five miles of construction on our beaches with the EIS process. We learn how to use the process and we won. It's hard work. What you have to do is you have to get people to look at the process and divide up the process into areas and then you ask questions and you make comments on every single issue that's in that, in that document and the, they have to answer every single question, every single comment has to be answered in writing. And all we had was like, at the most, a hundred people on Molokai doing this process. And we won. Imagine if we had thousands and thousands and thousands of people writing questions on all of the different issues in Hawaiian, in Japanese, in Korean, in, and they have to answer every single one. This thing is going to drive them nuts. This, this EIS process will not work. If they don't finish the EIS process, they cannot have their lease. They cannot have their master lease. So we can stop this thing that's going on on Mauna Kea by getting into this process because we have the warriors to do it. And we can do it legally. Stop this thing. So that's the message that we delivered to the governor's office. So we have all kinds of ways and all kinds of people that are working to stop this telescope. So right now I'm here to tell you that in all the years I've been working in the Hawaiian community, the feeling that I have right now is that this telescope will never be built on Mauna Kea. Right. Right. Never. There's just too much people involved and the young leaders that we have now Compared to what the young leaders was in the 1970s, there is no comparison. These young people have so much more in the quiver and the arrows in the back that they can use. There is no way that this telescope is going to be built. Mahalo. Walter Ridi from Molokai. Mahalo. Yeah, I think that um, I have to agree with him that as activists, we have to believe that we're going to win, yeah? If you don't believe you don't can win, you shouldn't be an activist. You shouldn't be fighting if you think you cannot win. You have to know that you're going to win. And so we have to walk with this confidence. Yeah? So mahalo ko Walter. Um, at this time, I'd like to I'd like to announce, recognize, 
acknowledge um, a great Hawaiian musician who has left us with many compositions um, for our lahui. Um, and every time I call, he comes. And to me, that that is the essence of being a Hawaiian national. Yeah? Those who come out to represent, to support, to call our lahui, our struggle. So at this time, if I could introduce Uncle Palani Vaughn and the King's Own. Palani Vaughn. We're live at the uh, OHA offices, Honolulu, Hawaii, 560 North Nimitz, if you want to come down. People are occupying the area, so we'll be here all night till the 12.30 meeting tomorrow, 12.30 p.m. meeting tomorrow. And we're under roof, it's safe, We've got uh, kids here, electricity, they left the bathrooms open for us, so come down for the whole night or part of the night. I'm broadcasting using cellular uh, data bandwidth so it gets a little shaky every now and then. Sorry about that. The audio should continue. The audio is the last to go. Up on stage is uh, Palani Vaughn so we'll be hearing from him very shortly. I'll pan around so you can see that we are uh, we're right outside the offices in a covered area of the mall. And we got people coming and going, but people are going to stay the whole night. We're under roof. Looks like uh, media here. So we have a stage here with a sound system. Alani Vaughn on the stage now. Getting uh, messages from Maui. Hello to everybody on Maui. Hello to everybody on the island of Hawaii, Hawaii Island, Mokuo Keawe. Thanks to Occupy Hilo Aloha. Media for the mirror. Aloha. It's so important that we do as Lahore. Even though we may think differently about minor issues or issues that cause us to debate. The one thing that I look at is that we must stand as Lahore. We learned before we got before we got into the academics of Hawaiian culture and history and the like. Our history, our culture, our language was passed down by the Pupuna. And I come from a generation where they didn't want me and my By the way, this gentleman, his father, was my classmate. And we were all part of that generation where they didn't want you to learn Hawaiian. They wanted you to speak English, be a good American. But thank God, many of us, a few of us, decided to pursue. And I'm really proud of John Sorio represents uh, academia at the University of Hawaii in the Hawaiian Studies program. Years ago when I was uh, I was a sophomore at UH Manoa, suddenly the, the only language courses they offered were German, 
Chinese, French, all those standards. And I kept looking for Hawaiian. But when I was a sophomore, suddenly I was aware that they were the school, the university was offering Hawaiian. And so I signed up for the class. About 12 of us showed up. And our professor was a beautiful, beautiful Hawaiian lady. Her name was Pua Anthony. Later on in life, she divorced her husband and became Pua Hopkins. But I, we all listened to her orientation. And then she, she took our names now and then she asked the question, is anyone planning to not take this Hawaiian course? And I asked her, why the question? And she said, because if anybody decides not, one of you decides not to take the course, she was at the threshold of cancellation. So if we didn't, one of us decided not to take it, she would, they would have to cancel the whole Hawaiian language class. But we stayed. Twelve of us stayed there. Some went on to be come in to become very accomplished uh, kumu. One who hails from the Big Island is Larry Kauanoi Kimura. And he started Hawaiian language and culture programs over at UH Hilo. But I'm proud to say that this first class, it was on this first class at UH that the whole department and Hawaiian studies was built. So thank God there were 12 of us who wanted to learn our own little Hawaii. Anyway, I was talking, I don't want to get too, too, too much into a little haole, but anyway, this uh, song, this medley of songs, I think tell the story what I was saying. By the way, this young gentleman's father was my classmate, as I said. His last name, his family's last name, is Maudakea. <laughs> Listen to the mission bells, ring it, ring it. Hear Hawaiian He stands alone, watching and waiting. His coconut hand now to do canes a weaving. His coconut hat. He is watching his people giving, giving their hearts full of laughter and song. of his eyes are changing, changing. The ways of his people are fading, fading. Come and keep on weaving 
Ez kogorodat Tudtuk a nőt Még mi van? But his Oopuna Remain To carry on As we are the Oopuna Of our ancestors, our Kuku And though our Kukuna Kahiko May have passed from this earth they are not gone, for they live on in the chants, the dances, the legends, the language of our people. And if we listen a little more closely to things, perhaps we can hear their voices in the winds, the whispering seas, for they are one. Sons and daughters of these islands, are you listening to the voices of our people? In the swirling winds, high on ancient body, hear them, feel them, hear them. Longer, 
must America take all of To act upon its 1990s Apology bill And return the kingdom of nothing To our queen That it took from her on January 17th of 1893 The legally magical jack and U.S. Marines How long? try and get them to change their position on the TMT. They're currently on record for favoring it. Uh, there's tremendous popular opposition to it. So we'll see. And if you want to come down, you should come down. The actual address is 560 uh, North Nimitz. And as you can see, it's like uh, upstairs of a shopping mall. And it's uh, actually mostly offices here. It's under roof. There are kids here, men, women, children. So bring mom, bring the kids. This is uh, downtown Honolulu, so there's, you know, there's food and stuff nearby. And Honolulu is like 24-hour town, so not much of a problem for most of It's kind of the opposite of being on Mauna Kea now. And big uh, respect if you're up there now or have family and friends up there. There's a total support for you from the people here. Um, if, if there are any live streamers out there, hey, come down. You know what? I got to go to work tomorrow, so I won't be able to 
cover uh, the day tomorrow or the meeting or the uh, action leading up to the meeting tomorrow during the day. So, if you're available, come down. If you want to learn live streaming, it's really easy. Probably can't do it while I'm live streaming, but you know, I'm willing to give a free workshop to anybody. If we had 10 live streamers down here, that wouldn't be too many. Hello. If we got none, that's too little. Mahalo to Uncle Palani Vaughn and the King's Own. Andre Perez. I love, I love his music. And I love, I love that Hawaiian national. We talk about Hawaiian consciousness and kingdom consciousness and, and Lahui and what it is to be a national. I think Uncle Palani Vaughn was way ahead of the pack. At this time, I'd like to welcome my professor, our professor, um, and an acclaimed musician in his own right, Hawaiian national educator, John Osorio. And he mentions it's next to Costco, and it is. You see me this time? Yep, yep. On, on your name under uh, uh, what's right? Yep, yep. Live Facebook, uh, oh, Facebook. On live stream too, you can do it. Yep. I'll tell you one thing about Mana. They really like vigils. <laughs> They love to just go someplace and camp out overnight. On the hill, not a That's the next thing. Coming up, John Azurio. Activist, University of Hawaii professor, musician, songwriter. Father of famous people. Gotta add that. I'm gonna play two songs. I'm not gonna talk too much. Get plenty of good people to talk to them. Good ideas. I'm gonna play this song. I wrote this song for a woman, but I was really writing about um, sort of saying goodbye to a Hawaii I knew when I was a child. Everything was changing so fast in the 1970s. That's what this is actually about. Often in the darkness, sometimes in the light, visions of your golden eyes sparkle in my sight. Thank you. 
I just want to do one more song. I got a tune first. Mahalo's going out to, to John Rosario up on stage. As I was saying, if you're a streamer or documentarian, we need you uh, when tomorrow Kilo during Kilo the day. This, um, um, there were no telescopes on the mountain. None. Zero. Nobody was talking about telescopes on the mountain when he wrote this song. And all it is, all this song is, is just a love song for that moment. It's very hard to explain to the Po'e Haole what sacredness means. It's very, very hard. Sometimes because they're too much caught up in their own idea of Christian sacredness. Sometimes because they don't really understand sacredness at all. So, you can get mad and try to whack them over the head to make them understand. Or you can sing love songs that show why a place is sacred. My friends and I would sometimes roam Trails of Mauna And in the evening we'd come home To see her standing there The moon And I could be forgotten And a thousand miles away And still I would recall The beauty
right outside of Oha offices downtown Honolulu, Hawaii, where we'll be the entire night occupying Oha to get them to change their position on the TMT. Loretta and all the warriors, Terry, all the old warriors. Hey, they want that one. We're going to win this one.
Thank you all. Just joined us. We're um, we're live at the offices of OHA, Office of Hawaiian Affairs, where a group of people will be here all night, waiting for their uh, meeting at 12:30. Hey, John Osorio. Hawaiian soul. At this time, I'd just like to let people know that uh, we're about to have some ava. Kavika Tendan is here, up here to my left, uh, preparing the kanoa for ava maikai. And I want to let you know that if you're going to drink ava, this type of ava that, that we serve, and that protocol, it's not the kind of ava where we walk around and talk story. Um, this ava is an intimate ava that is based on um, at least basic protocols of reverence for the sacredness of ava. So if you'd like to partake in some of the ava maikahi, you can come here and sit down on the low hala, uh, join the circle and engage. But we don't, uh, as Sam Ka'ai would say, Sam Ka'ai would say, ava is not grog. It's not, a, it's not a spirit to be drinking and walking around and getting pupuli. So, for us, Awa is always sacred and treated with reverence. So join them there on the map if you would like. Right here. Also, Heopu uh, Ali'i. Yeah, one of the, uh, the qualities of a leader of Kanaka is the ability to care for them and to feed them. So, I'd like to acknowledge Kapohana, Kamana Opono Crab, who came back to join us, bearing right. a whole stack of pizzas. <laughs> so, he bought some food for us and drink off to the side here. Uh, mahalo Nui, Kamana Opono. I really would like to uh, take this time to uh, acknowledge that Kamana Opono is here with us, with the Lahui, the Lahui Kanaka. And that is to me, one of the attributes of a leader, yeah. Stand and walk with the people. Now, if we can just convince those trustees. <laughs> uh, this time, I'd like to call up and introduce, actually no introductions needed. One of my dear friends, brothers, comrades, mentor, teacher, and uh, we share a sleeping bag on the Mauna. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to call up uh, one of our great Hawaiian educators, Hawaiian language expert, political theorist, teacher, consciousness raiser, Kaleko Akael. Mahalo Kaleko. I want to point out the ability to walk amongst the people is a sign of a true leader. Kaleko flew in from Maui, no notice, and caught the bus over here. I appreciate that. Mahalo. E to Puatani, e a te Mauriola. E ola hoki, o Mauriola. E ola ya o e tani tu me lono. Oya, o oya, e ola. E ala ua o ma ala ma lama wa hele ka ana ka inuna. Ua ka o ka wakula ka o wakali. Na o i hoa e ka o pua ma pua ma uli pua ma ke amo a ka ne moa i ni ma i ki na ka o lele kala. O wa o ke ni uli we a ka o ke a ka no i a ma i ta i ni tu a ta i ni moa i ma i ta i ni ta ma ta moa ka ni. E i a ma i ka puli ko wai ha ke a tua. Ha na i na i a o e ke a tua. E o la no we. E a ma i ha ma i tu i a ke a. E a ma i loko ma i loko ma i loko bo buka ma i ka mo ka i na ka la la ni a i na.
Bauka pua, bauka pua. Yo, eke aku, yo lah mai kau itu dia buat. Kalau balik mai kuma kau heba, mai kuma kau hau mian, mai kuma kau ayu, mai kuma kau ayah, mai kuma kau wahai heba, mai kuma kau hoi kikinu ane ya oi. Eh, mami yo mai oi ho bolo mai ama kau mai kikinu heliku helikolo, helene kolo pukua, hau makai oleh kalau pangalau hal. Aku lah mama kau ni ani, kau lah iya ke aku. Bela kau ayah aku, bela kau ayah aku ya oi ke aku. Bela aku umat dia oi. Ah mama uan oi. Bini nama kita loh, ano ay? Wow neo kalau kau, ikiki papa nol ke iya kena kene. No aku mau kupuni om mau, mau ya aku malah lapal. Nui kau mahalo kapoi opio kapoi nane hokel ne ki ya papa hana no kamala mana hola ane ki ano kapoi kanaka ki ki ayana kamala mana ina me pono e koka kopo e keki kaka kopo e mo puna ke kahi yola mau kalau e yola alo hai na koi e iyo Everybody repeat after me. 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 We. Me. Me. We. Me. Me. We. Famous words of the great Muhammad Ali. First of all, I have to say I'm very, very proud of the young leadership. Which has a role. Aya may Hawaii nuya kia. May loko may ukpo. We have come forward and stepped forward to revive and to lead us down this path. I must say, I was privileged to have met with many of these young leaders. Kahokahi, Lanakila, Havani, Ruth. Anui Nui, Huala Lai, and many others who are up there. And the number one quality I see in all of them, they're all true, Aloha Aina Oye Iko. All of them. They're all humble, there's no egos, and they all put in the work. I'm humbled that they have put themselves on the line in commitment for all of us, all of us here, the brown Hawaiian, the black Hawaiian, the white Hawaiian, the yellow Hawaiian, the curly hair Hawaiian, the long hair Hawaiian, the bowler hair Hawaiian. And his appeal has brought back Eo Kaina. I see him with my own eyes. Felt with my heart. In fact, the last day I was there, I was so impressed. These young people taken from uh, working together from Maui, from Hana, and from uh, Kalapana came together and put up a hale at the 900 or 9,300 foot level. And so, of course, the word was that uh, this is not occupation. This is a resettlement of our people upon those slopes. So young people don't talk about making one holiday. They put up a holiday. See, there's a difference between the walkers and the talkers. And these old people, they're walkers. Heyana makiala pono. He alakayana lako. He amako. Kiemuako. And it's clear. But this day has been coming for a long time. As I talk with Brother Anya, we know. And I say, I live my life as an educator to see this happen. And I, I tell this story, I remember <clears throat> 20 plus years ago, maybe a little more, many of us young students at the University of White Manoa, in fact, myself and Dr. Keanu Sai used to work for the university and go and talk in the schools to many of the young Hawaiians. And the consciousness back then was one when we would walk in and I would ask the question and I would say, who discovered Hawaii? 
And many of our young would raise their hand and they would say, Captain Cook in 1778. But see, things have changed since then. And that's the truth. Hey Allah, wow, Mala Malama, wa paukapo, wa aukapo. We have been reborn, reawakened, remade as a people upon this land. And today when I went out and asked that question, our young know the truth. You see, that's the power of the truth. As the great African rebel leader himself once said, then you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. But we as a people, we know we've been in these islands for nearly 2,000 years. We let Johnny come make this upon these shores. And it's our Kukuna who sailed across the Pacific Ocean, the largest body of water, 2,000 plus years ago, moving across the Pacific to come to these shores. And as I always tell my students, we must remember, we come from a people, a great people. We come from people who were the movers and shakers of the time. We come from the people of the highest arts and sciences. We don't come from lazy people who are sleeping until 10 o'clock in the morning. Our Kupuna were the ones who set the trend. See, we left those ones behind. And it's those people that came to these shores. And they developed this society here with great sciences. In fact, if you understand the word science, the science is really about knowing, you know, art of knowing, using empirical sciences to know, to study, to predict. How else did you understand these scientists to bring water to our life, to all the various systems to grow food? Today, yeah, this high level agriculture. People talk about, oh, fancy composting and organic farming. Our Kupuna knew all of these things. We talk about aquaculture today. But we know that fish farming, in the sense of fish ponds, started here in Hawaii. In fact, the land of my ancestors, my Kupuna, in Hana. So when they talk about this issue as if we are against science, they need to study a little bit of their own history. While we were still in the world, many of those of the European persuasion were still living in caves and eating cold meat, as I say. That's the truth. They ever heard of the Dark Ages? So while they're in the Dark Ages, we were building a great civilization here. But you see what made us so understanding, knowledgeable as a people, really is the idea of aloha, which you see coming through. See, that's the science. Aloha. To have compassion, to have love, to share, to tell the truth. That's the sign of society. Not one of taking care of a few. We had no homeless in our society. We didn't have people going hungry. And yet they tell us that they're the civilized nation. I know this when Captain Cook came. At least the wine is made every day. And they tell us we were the savages. So you gotta understand, it depends on who's the storyteller. And in this history I know when we came with this bomb, and we created this great society. Even when Captain Cook himself landed on these shores, he was really impressed with what he saw. He never saw a place so developed in regards to for food production and cleanliness. See, if they call it as clean, it makes you wonder what they were like. If you looked around and said, wow, these guys were healthy, it makes you wonder what they were like. But yet they called us the savages. See, this question of humanity is the core issue in this question. This movement is about us as a people reclaiming our humanity as 
a people. We no longer shall tolerate others to tell us what our destiny will be, what is or what is not sacred, what our history is, what our culture is. Because we understand today that power to define is the question of power. Who the hell are they to tell us what is sacred? Who are they to tell us our history? We all know our history. Captain Cook discovered us in 1778. Hell no. We've been here for 2,000 years. And in our history we know. We all should know this history. In 1810, Kamehameha unites the islands. In 1839, we have our first Declaration of Rights. 1840, we have our first Constitution. In 1843, we become a recognized independent nation state. The first non-European nation state. That's our Kukuna who did this. That's our humanity. But you see in the educational department, in the schools, they forgot about this history. Not by chance, but by purpose. See, that's our humanity. So when people talk about, oh, you Hawaiians, you guys want sovereignty. You see, that's part of the fool's game. Because if you understand the history, you realize from 1843 on, we have been a sovereign people in this land. That is the truth. We also got to recognize what went down. 1854, we recognized as a neutral country. A neutrality is understood around the world. 1887 begins the downfall with the Bayonet Constitution, the first half of the so called overthrow. 1893, they land their troops with guns. Not a process of revolution by the people against the wealthy and the oppressors. It was the oppressors themselves with the guns who came in to try and snatch, and I use the word, try and snatch away our rights as a people to be free humans upon this land. And in July 1993, to push a fake session, a treaty of annexation, and we do know the President of the United States at that time, Grover Cleveland, takes it away and says, in fact, he doesn't recognize the so-called puppet government, neither de facto nor de jure. Well, these cats, of course, the so-called comedia safety, the provisional government, transformed itself to what becomes the Republic of Hawaii in 1894, and by 1897, they push again for another treaty of annexation. And in this treaty of annexation attempt, our people unite Virtually all Hawaiians united in struggle, led by the two Hui, Hui Aloha and Hui Kalai Aina, to amass the so-called two eight petitions, which forever sealed the voices of our people, who said, we don't want annexation. We don't give our consent to the taking of one, our nationality, and our national lands. That is our record. That is something we all should know. That is something we all should celebrate. That is something we want to make sure every Hawaiian understands that question. That we never gave up our consent as a people. We never gave up the title to our national lands. And we will forever, I said, forever fight until the last Aloha Aina lives. And what happens to the so-called Treaty of Annexation in 1897? Well, the Queen Lili also submits a protest letter, and the so-called treaty fails. It fails. I repeat, the so-called Treaty of Annexation fails. So the lie of a treaty is a lie. It's fraud. It's a facade. There is no treaty of annexation. 
1898, the United States military already planning a war with the Spanish to build the empire, this imperial empire of expansion into the Pacific and into the Atlantic. The so-called Spanish-American War will preoccupy Hawaii to prepare for this war. And Hawaii then is claimed to be taken via what's called the New Lands Resolution of 1898. Again, was it a treaty? Aole. Aole. It was a resolution. And anyone can tell you, take your civics, take your basic political science 101, you should know. The power of resolution of a country is only within the defined borders of that country. It has no effect in a foreign country. In a country like ours, which by that time already had five treaties with the United States. The problem is, there isn't a six, you see, that's the problem. But they make believe, they pretend, they lie, as if there is a six. See, that's the game. Our minds have been pimped, as you may think, to somehow believe that there was some kind of legal action to take our lands, to take our nationality, all of it being fraud. In 1900, the so-called Organic Act, Another scam. But he basically said the Republic of Hawaii cedes all their lands, whatever lands they may be, to the United States. Of course, the question is, well, what the hell lands did the Republic of Hawaii actually own? And if they own those lands, by what instrument and in what year and in what exact case did they receive these lands? See, that's the fraud. It also says, interesting enough, all citizens of the Republic of Hawaii are now citizens of the United States. Okay? But who are citizens of the Republic of Hawaii? Less than 4,000 of them. They never address as us, we, the Kanaka. Because they can't. They cannot forcibly take someone's citizenship without their consent. But see, that's the game. And this lie was taught to us in schools. As Brother Skippy says, miseducation in the public education, fairy tale that you learned in school. No more true than Rumpelstiltskin and Snow White. The fact is, we never ceded these lands. We never gave consent to our nationality being taken. So we understand, we look at what's going on in Mount Nakia, we understand the reason why we're in this predicament is not only what they are doing to us, you see, you understand that. It's not just what they are doing to us, what they have done to us. It's also our failure to remember these stories and these histories. But you see, as we start to reawaken, see the good news is we never forget totally the good news is our kupuna kept these things all solidified as, as the great Uncle Eddie Kaanana used to tell us all the time. Liu ikapakai, Liu ikapakai, which means everything is salted. You know Kalikwa, everything your kupuna did is out there. We never really lose nothing. And the idea of Liu ikapakai, just like when you salt the fish, where the fish is salted good so it's going to be preserved for a future time. And when you're ready to eat, you take the fish, you wash them off, get all prepared, and then you eat. See, a kupuna left all this for us. The kule petitions, the history in the newspapers, speeches by people like Navahi and Kalao Kalani and Robert Wilcox, all left for us to read and understand what our people thought. So all we got to do today, of course, is reawaken ourselves to understand this history, we teach this history. To remember our humanity. Our humanity is our kuniana. That's the thing we must remember. That's our kuniana. So when you look at the question of Mauna Kea, we understand Mauna Kea is in this situation because they're taking advantage of our dehumanization. See, dehumanization is the idea that we are less than human. Dehumanization is the idea that we don't have a history. 
that we don't got a culture, that we don't have sacred space. Oh, maybe you think of things as being sacred, but we have something more important than that. So what you see happening around the care really is dealing with that question. This telescope, the TMT, is that we had enough as a people. You cannot go to the top of that mountain and not realize and not feel being invaded and not feel the eha. You know the word in Hawaiian? The mountain is being sat upon by these invaders without our consent. Upon the summit of that mountain that we know are part of our Aina Ali. These are crown lands belong to our people. There is no doubt. That is the true history. Lands that we never given consent to be taken. So the question of Mount Akiya and what needs to preserve is our Kuliya. It's not some scientist that you meet, which I've met. Some of the head scientists in places like the IFA, they're not even from this place. The one that is from Germany, and he's there telling me they need to use our mountain for their purposes, for their curiosities. I'll tell you a story about Maui. Struggling over the question of Hanat Allah. About eight years ago, I met with the head person with the NSF, with the Solar Observatory. His name, Craig Foles. Craig Foles. Craig Foles. National Science Foundation. See, these are the kind of people you gotta confront. And I asked him, I said, you know, Gandhi said, the great Gandhi said, one of the seven sins is science without humanity. Science without humanity. So I asked him, and I said, what's the Kanaka? I want to know, what is the humanity? Tell me why you got to desecrate us. Why I got to feel this era. What is the humanity? And his exact quote were in his words, which I'll never forget. Pure, selfish research. Pure, selfish research. And I looked at him and in my mind, I wish I could reach across and choke him by his neck. <laughs> That's the truth. How dare this guy come to our land and ignore my humanity as a person. See, I was there to find out maybe he had some kind of great... Because you don't know all this truth, I tell you right now, if there was something of great, you're going to save lives, you're going to feed people. I can take the air high as a Hawaii. I know that. Because my culture tells me so life is the most important thing out there. Well, Kapu Kiola, Yakani. Life is what's important. But all he got to say to me was pure selfish research. Great folks. Great folks, great folks. May his name never be forgotten in Hawaii. You see, me, these guys come into town thinking that their scientific research outweighs our humanity, our ways of knowing. And the only way they can do it, you see, you understand, the only way they can do it is to see us as less than human. That our history is not real history. That our culture is not real culture. Right. Our spirituality, eh, not that important. And many of us who've been through this process, we know this. Hearings after hearings, testimonies, EISs, EAs, through all the various processes. And you see, right at the Palapala, you say, oh yeah, a very important culture and sacred site. And then, they build them anyway. Why even go through the process? Why dehumanize us in this process? Because they can. Because in the eyes, Hawaiians are less than human. You can understand that. They see us as people that have yet no history and sense of humanity. But you see, the bottom line is this. It doesn't matter what they think. It doesn't matter what 
let me try anymore. Because our people know for themselves our history. We know our culture. We know we have a right to self-determination. We know we have a right to define. And we refuse to allow these people anymore. As they say, just say no. <laughs> to tell us what our lives should be. Who should define for us what is ours? And who should determine for us our path into the future? That is our Kuliana. As people have been here for 2,000 years again. But this is a struggle. And again, I use this word struggle because it is one. It takes commitment, it takes dedication, it takes sacrifice. And I look in the young eyes of those who are on the mountain. I saw all of that. Gee, I'll never be to my first page. I better put this page in. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Maybe I save this one for later or something. <laughs> but this I also tell our people, especially you cannot come out here, our lives are not cheap. Our lives are not cheap. You know, when Cook came, there were about 800,000 of us, maybe up to a million. And by the time of the overthrow, there were only 40,000 of us who survived. Only about 5%. Only 1 in 20 survived by 1893. I want you guys to think about this, all your wives. Remember this. 19 of the 20 didn't make it through. And we who are here are the descendants of that 5%. So our lives are not cheap. Our lives are special. As the Kupuna say, And we are the poor. And we're still here. And we're getting more educated. And we're getting stronger. And we're getting tougher. And we're growing as a Lahui. As his words, the whole Lahui inspired us to understand. They may have been 40,000 back then, but there are about half a million of us today. And I say, maybe we don't have the power of the gun. But we have the power of truth and the power of aloha. Including the kind of aloha when we're going to be up to a million Hawaiians in here real soon. We're going to make our way to the top. That's one of the things I would say. Make to the Hawaiian today. Support the cause. As the great Mama Hadi used to tell me, and cause really tell the girls that I would listen, and she would say, don't look at it, get at it. <laughs> well, I think you also got to understand, you see, the so-called settler, the so-called occupier, colonizer, foreigner, who come to Hawaii, the Korea. See, one of the jobs is to confuse us. As the great Kwame Turi tells us, they want to make you believe that their culture and your culture, one in the same. They want to make you believe their history and your history are one in the same. Their heroes and your heroes are one in the same. You see, once they get you thinking in that way, you effectively have become them. Their goal is to erase your humanity. And in that erasure, you become a supporter. See, the term hegemon is a fancy term, perhaps, in political science. But again, it's an idea that strong influence, which makes you become complicit, makes you become complicit, complicit in your own dehumanization, your own deculturation, your own sense of self worth to support their goals over your own. In fact, you start to think, that your own depravity is part of what's good. You start to believe 
when they tell you, oh, you Hawaiians, can I get along? Well, what happened in 1897? What is happening today? See, these are all part of this influence, these mind games, which are really meant to erase that sense of who we are. But see, once you know who we are, once you understand that history, there's no turning back. We got them on the run. They know it, and we know it. That's the great Kwaipuna Preji. I use this word, Yoshi, but take the chains off your brains. Take the chains off your brains. That we get so worried about the chains of our legs. But it's really about the chains of our brains that you worry about. Those chains make us feel afraid. Make us become apathetic. Make us become tame, docile, domesticated, willing. To be mistreated. And in this confusion, we forget our own understanding. Rakia Kupula left us with all this knowledge. Aole Mako Eminamina. Ikabuku Kala Oke Aokuni. Walava Mako Ikapo Haku. Ika Aikama Haoka Aina. Ika ay kamaha uka ay na. What truly did is important to us. But the ay na. There is no summer. And I'm going to ask this to the trustees, and we're going to talk with them tomorrow, I guess. How much is our land worth? How much is the mountain worth to our people? $10 million? $200 million? $1 billion? You see, we all know, in our hearts we understand, the bank account will do nothing to provide a future for us to be here 100 years, 500 years. What guarantees us a place here is the air Oka'aina. The air Oka'aina. Air Oka'aina. Not the size of your wallet or a bank account or your checking book. Eokaina, the ability to live and feed and sustain yourself on this land, to determine yourself on this land, that is which we must fight for and understand. See, that's why Mauna Kea is such an important struggle. It's the highest peak in these islands. It's one of the most sacred and revered spaces for our people, which is currently occupied by telescopes from all over the world. How many Hawaiian telescopes we got up there? How many? Tell the truth. Have any up there? And we sit on the side looking at the telescopes as if it's ours. As if we got something to do with those telescopes. These telescopes are monuments of the settler racism, of the settlerism, this, this uh, process of colonialism, which they believe that they benefit outweighs ours as the native people here. But no longer will we be tame. No longer will we be quiet. No longer shall we be confused. See, the medicine, the love of all of this is the education of our people. It's the commitment to this education. When we know our history, when we know our language, we know our culture, our dances, our prayers, our chants, there's nobody can defeat us in what we need to do. There's nothing that can stand away but just our own selves. See, they understand this. This is why they banned our language. This is why they denigrated our culture, denigrated our kupuna. Because they understood the way to control our people is to control their minds. The way to control our people is to control their souls. The way to control our people is to control their destiny. The way to control the people is to create disunity. And what you see happening in Hawaii today is the lap out to all of that. And we are the biggest threat to the so-called fantasies of the so-called master race who believe 
that their curiosities outweigh our humanity. And we must not be afraid to call them out on this. We must not be afraid to tell them they're a bunch of supremacists. We must not be afraid to tell them the truth of our history and our culture. We must not be afraid to tell them that we reclaim the right to define ourselves in our own lands. Aloha aina oya iho. Aloha aina oya iho. Aloha. To love and have this compassion. Aina. And yet which feeds us, sustains us, gives us all life. And oya iho. Truth. When I look as a philosophy and ideology to fight supremacy, to fight the kind of evil that is upon this land which believes that their desires outweigh our needs is the philosophy of Aloha Aina Moya Iho. At all times, we must love. We must have compassion. At all times, we must remember first, as our kupuna said, the Aipuhaku, it's about the land. So we don't get distracted about the money or entitlements or what Washington DC is gonna do or how many uh, revenue streams you're gonna get. And finally, the Oya Evil. That we must be truthful at all times. We must tell the truth. We must confront with truth. And this power of truth and love is the only thing, I repeat, it's the only thing that can defeat This empire, which settles upon our mountains and our shores. This empire, which has more nuclear weapons than any, in fact, all the other countries put together. And they talk about weapons of mass destruction, send them off to Iraq and Afghanistan. And holy crap, all you gotta do is open your eyes and understand. Weapons of mass destruction are right here in our own backyard. There's no place that's been as militarized, commercialized, missionized, deculturized as our people. And even though they got all their guns and bombs, and our history of using those nasty instruments of death upon native peoples. All you gotta do is read your history. I believe, and I know all of us believe here, there's one thing that can conquer that. And that's the power of Aloha Aina Oyeo. So, it's not if they come, but when they come to the Mount Eta, with all their guns, whether it's the police or state police, but a national guard, as the rumors have been said, we will show our strength as a people to resist, to confront with love and truth and determination. They may come to us one day, we'll be back up there the next. They may take 50 the first day, we'll come back with 100. They take the 100, we'll bring 500. They take 500, we bring 1,000 up to the mountain. And I want the world to see these armed guards taking away our kupuna, our makua, and even in our king to show the world that we demand our right to be human beings and be free in this world in our own land. We demand our humanity, even in the face of their weaponry. Because we know in the end we got love and truth on our side, and the love and truth is going to keep us here in this land. All it takes for us is our commitment to those principles. Because our power 
come from this aina. And it's to me, it's not no coincidence. They're from this aina from the highest point. point. The closest to the heavens is leading us all through this path. See, this is the rebirth. This is the rebirth of our Lahui. This is the rebirth of our unity as a people. This is rebirth of our community to take our future in our hands. Whether it's education, whether it's the revitalization of our language and culture, whether it's putting us back in our homelands, it's up to us to make it happen. Because all we gotta understand the dominated oppressor will never give unto us what is ours. It is only us through our unification, through our love of this place, is gonna take us where we need to go. And we all have a role in this, everyone, to take our part, to take our place, to move us forward, to learn our history. Anyway. Let me just end. Since we're in Oha, I just want to maybe I leave the ghosts of my words to the trustees tomorrow. The people have awakened and are on a move. Our people are on a move. As I, as I told one of the trustees last week, whether Oha supports us or not, we are moving. And it's up to Oha and the trustees themselves to decide Oh, I wish just for once that they're the side of the people. When I hear stories of millions of dollars that are going to be given away very soon for the so-called nation building campaign, a couple of million dollars to play around with nameless. See, nameless isn't nation building. This is nation building going on right now. Nation building is struggling. Nation building is standing with your people for this man. That's what you're going to No nameless is going to give us where we need to go. And we, have, we all understand that. We understand that here. And two million dollars will be going in that direction. And not even 25 cents. Not even 25 cents from our monies is going to support. The struggle, I use the word the, the struggle of our people today. See, the truth is telling. The truth reveals. But I have hope. If I didn't hope, I wouldn't say this. We got to have hope as a people. At all times, we got to hold on our hands, all our hands, to come and join and unite and understand. Our unity as a people is number one. And let me just end by saying, and for all the non Kanaka who are here, who live here, have Keiki here, Mo'opuna here, who have parents have been buried here, and I always say this I know one day your Eve and my Eve will be in this ground together. One day your grandchild and my grandchild may get together. So in the end, it's all of our Kuliana to make the best of this place. Because Aloha Oye Iyo is that which can bind all of us, all of us, all of us for a richer and better tomorrow. Imua Kako, Aloha. Firebrand populace. 
firebrand populist speaks on Mauna Kea. Mahalo Kalekoa yeah, for the fire. Mahalo <laughs> Kalekoa for the fire. One little spark, yeah, we need that one spark. One spark to set off, to ignite the lahui. Yeah, that one spark. I remember Skippy Yowani telling me, ah, we need small fires, small fires. But small fires cause big damage. Yeah. So we see our lahui growing, yeah. Um, mahalo again, Kalekoa. At this time, I'd like to uh, call up a good friend of ours, uh, one of our Mana Wahine sisters in Mana, and also uh, a longtime organizer for Kahea, who has followed and tracked this case and organized on this issue of uh, Mauna Kea for many, many years, Shelly Munioka. And I tell you, if you want to know about the history, the detailed history of this issue, Shelly is really a good person to talk to. Mahalo, Shelly. Um, a lot of people didn't have the distinct pleasure or displeasure of seeing how that played out really in these cases. And it was really painful and uh, people should know that because the narrative in the public right now is like we're making something out of nothing. But I can tell you, and you can go look, it's in the public record, that when we were doing the contested case um, over the construction permit, the lawyer for UH told Antipua Case that why couldn't she cover the TMT with her hand and continue to her practice. So this was around a discussion of the blue plane from Mauna Kea to Haleakala. And that's the plane where the TMT is going to be. And for Hawaiians, we understand the importance of blue planes and connection. The same way we understand the importance of relationship between the relationship between people and land, and the relationship between land and other land. So that viewpoint is very important, and they're saying it won't completely obstruct your view. Why couldn't you walk around the telescope and then look at Haleakala? Why couldn't you cover it with your hand, and still you have another hand, you could still make motions, you could still do your practice, and that's the kind of really offensive, racist, things that were coming out in the case that, you know, the general public doesn't hear about, yeah? Um, so what Kalikoa is saying is very much true about the true nature of, of this case. Um, that being said, I wanted to talk a little bit about why we engage uh, at, in a state process when we all know the illegitimacy of the state as Kalikoa just laid that out for us. And why do we participate anyway? Um, and I think it's important to acknowledge um, Perceived power can have real impacts, even if it's illegitimate. So, you know, if we are ever to get our country back, we need these lands to be in good condition. We can't let them off the hook um, of taking care of those lands because they try to trap you in that argument. If you say we're illegitimate, don't participate in this process. But that's that's a false false trap, yeah? So, yes, it is illegitimate and we'll still participate in this process because it's that important to do that, yeah? So, um, I was kind of thinking a little bit about a, a metaphor of, about this, how I can think about why we keep doing this. And what came to my mind was, um, if anybody's ever had to clear California grass, you know, in a patch, and you know really what you have to do is like dig it out from the root, but it's sometimes really hard to do that when it's like, you know, all furry and you're getting all cut up and sometimes you need to cut it back before you can get to the root. And I really think that the root of this is exactly what Kalekoa was talking about with the um, colonial history in Hawaii and, and the dispossession of, of Hawaiians. Um, and what we're, that's really the root, but sometimes can I get to that root, you have to address all of the furry stuff on the top and that's what's happening right now. So, I don't know, that's one, one way of thinking about it, but okay. A couple other things I just wanted to take the chance to address, kind of miss 
statements or misinformation that I've been hearing. Um, one thing is about the sublease. So TMT has been talking about how they're going to be paying a million dollars in lease rent, which is so different than all of the other sublease telescopes up there, which are paying nothing or a dollar a year. Firstly, they want to separate that into, you know, we have nothing to do with that. We weren't even around, you know, we can't be liable for that. They don't understand that for us, it doesn't matter. There's only one mountain. And the, all of the misuse, we cannot just erase that, yeah? Um, but also, by their own rules, uh, this million dollars that they're talking about won't come in until the 11th year of that sublease. So when I went to DNR, you know, I asked them, all I'm hearing is 10 years of non-compliance with your quote-unquote fair market rent. Not that I agree that a million dollars is a fair market rent, but that's their own argument, right? So it's this very kind of circular logic, but um, it's important that we call them even on, you know, on their own false statement. So it kind of gets to the other thing I wanted to talk about, which is uh, the TMT's, their own environmental impact statement, they have language in there that says that all of the previous telescopes have had significant, substantial adverse impact on Mauna Kea, um, which is the exact language in the law that um, projects in the conservation district can't have that kind of impact. So their own EIS says that, right? So I was like, okay, so how are they still proposing this? Uh, because if you read on, their argument is that their project considered alone does not cause a significant impact. The reason why it's important to know that, that that poor logic is what's being put out there is because it shows us their intent. Their intent is to parse words so that they can get around the protection of this important place. They don't, they, it's not a genuine process where they're really trying, you know, where they really care about um, impacts to Mauna Kea. So when that issue was kind of coming out, my testimony to them was about it's like having a bucket of water that you've already conceded is overflowing. Now you're going to tell me that you're going to dump more water into this, but all the water that spills out isn't yours. For us, that's a ridiculous argument. We only have one mountain, the fact that there are already 13 up there. We can't parse that out and say, oh, it doesn't matter, because well, your words alone won't have a significant impact. Yeah? So I really think that it gets to um, the important distinction between protester and protector. Because at first I was like, it's kind of a semantic difference, but it's really, really key. And it, it, you can see that in the, um, the rationale of the two sides. Yeah. Um, okay. The last thing that I wanted to say is that, you know, the issue that's kind of coming up down the line is that UH is asking for a new general lease for another 65 years on Mount Nakia. Their current lease expires in 2033, and um, the TMT is not supposed to be operational until 2024, although with the recent protection of the Mauna, it probably will be later than that, all right? Uh, and so even given that, that's only nine years on the lease, is what their trade-off for all of this irreversible damage, yeah? um, And that doesn't include time to take the telescope down which the lease also requires them to do, yeah. So, um, DOH is going to try and tell you that they've changed, and it's a different game. They admit it was bad in the past because they have to because it's documented. But, as evidence that they're not sincere in those kinds of statements, I just want to say that the lease that they put forth for the new general lease, right now we all know they're only paying a dollar a year. They asked for zero dollars a year on this new lease. So that should tell you their intent about how they, how sincere they are about taking care of Mauna Kea really being different in the future. They don't mean that, we know that, it's all over the record. No, no amount of PR spin will change that. Yeah. That's right. So um, that's basically all the things I wanted to say tonight. Um, and it's just exciting to see everybody. and. Hope to see you next time. Thank you. Thank you. Mahalo, Shelly. Mahalo. Okay, gang, at this time, um, it's 
9.30. Um, I just want to remind everyone a couple of things. Again, why we're here. Yeah. Why, what's our purpose? And we're here obviously at OHA because we need OHA. We need OHA to stand with the Lahui. We need the trustees. Whatever it takes. Agendize, Mauna Kea, come to their senses, whatever. We need OHA, who manages much seated lands, so-called seated lands revenues, and Hawaiian resources and trust. We need them to stand with the Lahui. I was just overheard Kahawakahi today say they've been on the Mauna for one month. And when we was up there, we saw families, mothers, fathers, Keiki, Opio, Makua, Kupuna, holding it down on the Mauna. And we cannot allow the Board of Trustees to be idle, to be inactive. They have a responsibility to all of us. They have a responsibility to Mauna Kea, and we have a responsibility to hold them accountable. So our purpose here is to hold them accountable and to say, we need you. You must stand with this Mahui. Whatever deals are made behind the back door for money, for grants, scholarships, is irrelevant. The Mahui is moving. And the, Lahui, the wave is, is rising, and that wave is going to crash. And Oha is either going to be part of that wave, or they're going to get left behind. So that's our purpose here. I want to remind everyone tomorrow, the reason we chose tonight was tomorrow there's a Board of Trustees meeting at 12.30. We need to, if we go home, we need to come back. We need people to come out to this uh, Board of Trustees meeting. Again, 12.30 tomorrow. We need to put the pressure on the Chair, Trustee Bob Lindsay, and the rest of the trustees. They cannot drag their feet any longer. We need them. To, make, to be decisive and to be on the right side. And those, those Kanaka on the Mauna, we have to always think of them and their sacrifice. And we're here on behalf of them to hold OHA accountable. And though there's a lot of arguments going on right now about Mauna Kea, about science and technology, about Hawaiians um, being uh, just aole negative, um, we don't like anything, and a lot of stuff, but at the end of the day, when I went up to the Mauna and I saw what was there, and we know your history, we know our history about land title and jurisdiction, do we have the right to say no more? And for me, that is a simple question. Do we have the right to say no more power? So what if they build 13? They're not gonna build 14. That's our right. We have the right of self-determination. We have the right as Kanaka who stand, who come from this land. Yeah, Aloha Aina tells us more than just care for the land. It tells us about our relationship with the land. It connects us to our cosmogonical understandings of the land that we come from this very land. Yeah, and so we have the right as stewards and caretakers of this land, as people who are part of this land, to say no more. Um, at this time, I'd like to just kind of wrap things up and ask everyone who's still here to please join us on this side. If we can get all the Lahala mats and expand the area around the Ava, I think that it would be really good for us to kuka kuka, yeah? To sit down and talk and form our alliances, to strategize, to figure out how we're going to stand together in unity to fight this monster on the mountain, yeah? So, mahalo kui. Um, to everyone who came out and to all of our viewers out on uh, social media, um, it's very important uh, that we unite our strength and unity is our power. So mahalo nui, aloha. Aloha. Mahalo. Thank you. We are live at uh, right outside the OHA offices. There will be a People staying here all night, overnight, um, to uh, be ready for the OHA trustees meeting tomorrow at 12.30 or minus 10 GMT.
So it's 9.30 p.m. 9.30 p.m. exactly here in Honolulu. Uh, I just want to shout out and a mahalo to all the viewers from all over the, the uh, other islands and the uh, Hawaii Island, Mokuo Keawe, and Maui, uh, Kauai, there were viewers. Uh, viewers from uh, Toronto, Canada on Turtle Island. I'll probably be cutting off now, there, but uh, people will be here all night. People will come and go all night. Uh, maybe we'll take a little walk down the mall so you know where we are. We're on the second floor of, uh, I think it's a Gentry Pacific Center, that's what it used to be called. It's at 560 uh, North Nimitz, and as you can see, let me uh, hang on a second. There is uh, a lot of food here, and plus, you know, this is downtown Honolulu, so that we're near. It's a 24/7. Um, so we don't have to worry about supplies we don't have to worry about the rain we're under a roof there's uh, Anonymous right there <laughs> Anonymous is here uh, the uh, program was videotaped too uh, so I don't know when that will process and come out this broadcast automatically saves it live stream you might have to give it half an hour or so, but it becomes available for um, it becomes available for replay on demand uh, right after I stop broadcasting. I want to thank uh, Occupy Hilo Media, Kerry Peterson, Marks, and those guys for mirroring uh, the live stream. That means they put it on their. Uh, stream and rebroadcast it. You can see here we are right outside OHA. OHA is the acronym for Office of Hawaiian Affairs. And we can see people uh, getting ready to spend the night here. So we are three hours and 35 minutes into our live stream. I got batteries, I can go nine hours. Um, but people are going to go to sleep soon. Uh, talk story like that. This is the end of the program, so I'm going to be cutting out. Thanks again for everybody that joined us. And if there's a live streamer out there, we need somebody tomorrow at 12:30 or before, anytime during the morning or uh, during the day. I can't make it. I'm at work. I took work off today. So if you can come down here.